Good afternoon. Can you hear me and see me okay? Yes, yes we can hear you and see you. Sound and video chat? We can hear you, Council Member Alvarez, and see you. Can you hear us? I can indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, if I switch over to my uh, notes, can you still see me? No. Okay. Very well. Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, and I see Councilwoman Fleming, so it looks like we do have a quorum. Welcome everyone to our February 14th, 2023 uh, Santa Rosa City Council. It is now 3.30 and we will be starting our meeting. Welcome Madam City Manager um, and fellow council members. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, council member Stapp will be absent for this meeting. Council member Rogers. Here. Council member Okrepke. Here. Council member Fleming. Here. Council member Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor McDonald. Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show all council members are present with the exception of council member Stapp. Thank you. We will begin our meeting today with item 3.1, interviews for our housing authority vacancies. The purpose of the housing authority is to ensure adequate, decent, safe, and sanitary housing for qualified people within Santa Rosa, consistent with federal, state, and local laws. The housing authority primarily consists of the Santa Rosa Housing Trust and Rental Housing Assistance Programs, both of which are responsible for improving the quality and affordability of housing within our city. Today we will interview four applicants for the Housing Authority to fill three at-large vacancies, each to serve a four-year term expiring December 31st, 2026. We will start with Andrew Smith, then we will continue with Jeremy Newton, Jeffrey Owen, and Tony Neal in that order. Andrew Smith, may we please invite you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Can Thank you please you for having me here? I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. Can you please tell us why we should appoint you to the Housing Authority? Well, first of all, housing is probably one of the most important items in our city uh, to keep the financial well-being going. We have a great place to live here for most of us. Uh, for those who who don't have a good place, we need to do something for them. It's an issue that I have followed, uh, both uh, building for you know, middle income to lower income. Uh, I'm retired and I do a lot of uh, uh, volunteer work. I'm on a committee for transportation and land. And I have an interest in helping my city you know, keep on being a good place to live. And I've owned a couple of houses. I've been fortunate. But uh, I've been on the other side where, you know, I didn't always have the money to buy something or live in a better place. And I take the time to read. I attend a lot of the uh, 
uh, meetings. For example, I was at the meeting last year at the, uh, in April at the Steel Community Center to understand what the city was doing on the plan they were proposing and uh, a lot of questions to be asked. And uh, I read all the documents that come in, uh, especially the last one. So it's an interest I have uh, and I have the time to uh, give back to my city. I think that's uh, very important. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing none, we would like to thank you, Mr. Smith, for coming here today. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. And we will be now going to Jeremy Newton. Thank you. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you would be appropriate for the Housing Authority Board? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks again for having me today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Newton. <clears throat> um, I was a uh, Navy veteran. I uh, grew up in Houston, graduated from the Naval Academy, and uh, flew fighter jets for a number of years, did a couple combat uh, deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, did some time in Washington, D.C. as a legislative affairs officer working in the Senate, and then um, left active duty uh, to pursue a career in the commercial industry, uh, managing projects and overseeing budgets and things like that, uh, mostly manufacturing. Um, I uh, miss flying, so I got back into the cockpit. Uh, my family and I moved back here to California, Santa Rosa. Uh, where I'm currently working as an uh, airline pilot for United Airlines. <clears throat> I'm also still in the Navy Reserves. Uh, throughout that time, uh, I've been taught that uh, as a citizen, um, you get involved in your community and you tackle the toughest issues. Uh, one of the most pressing issues for this city, the region, and the state uh, in general is, is housing. Uh, and most other issues can be drawn back to, uh, to housing. Um, so. Um, I want to do my part to, uh, to get involved um, on the Housing Authority and hopefully um, provide some solutions to, uh, to this issue. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Do we have any questions from the council? Looking online, I see no questions. Well, thank you very much for being here today. And we will now move on to Jeffrey Owen. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, apply again for the Housing Authority. I've been on it for four years, been active as a chair, chair for the Housing Authority right when COVID started um, and vice chair now. Um, been helpful in trying to get the Housing Authority to look at requests from a more objective nature in terms of putting a point process in place worked uh, diligently with uh, with the council and um, the housing authority in regard to the CDBG funds that came in for the disaster recovery that was $38 million, which is a big chunk of money. Normally it's six to $7 million. Um, I'd like to be able to continue to work with that and work with the housing authority. My background has been in uh, finance for either developers or banks. I've been on both sides of either approving affordable housing finance structures and tax credit structures or being working for a developer and going for applications. So I've seen both sides on it from a, from a lending standpoint and applicant standpoint. Housing for affordable needs is very is a definitely strong need in this community. I'd like to be able to continue to help with that um, and help the city hit its arena numbers and that are doing, that are, the city's going very well right now in terms of being able to provide units and be able to continue to do that. Thank you very much for being here. And do we have any questions from council members looking online, seeing none? Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> council member Rogers. 
It's actually, it's not a question, and so I apologize. I just wanted to thank you for your service. Uh, and I know, uh, particularly with the CDBG funds, that's been really important for the community. And so I want to appreciate the work that you've done with staff and the diligence on that. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. All right, seeing no additional comments or questions, thank you very much for being here today. And we will now go you, to Tony Neal. Good afternoon. Hi there. Um, why, why, do, why should I be included, right? Um, I have a lot of heart for this issue uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is that I am a senior and I am currently looking for affordable housing so that I can retire. Uh, not only that, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community and I feel like we're not really focusing enough there in meeting those needs and being broad enough in our inclusion. Um, it's obvious that housing is not only a national but a regional crisis and we need to provide more housing for everybody. Um, I'm definitely at the age now where I want to be of service and give something back to my community. I love this place. I've lived here since I I moved here in the early 70s to go to Sonoma State from Southern California, uh, so I'm a California native. And uh, my whole family lives here, my kids, grandkids, etc. And I want this to be the most wonderful place to live ever. Thank you. And do we have any questions or comments from council at this time? Looking online, Councilwoman Fleming. I see a question. On yes, um, I'm just wondering if the last person, um, if the mayor or the last person could state the last person's name one more time. Tony Neal. Tony Nell. 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 Tony Nell. Okay. And Thank you. Nancy E L L, like little Nell. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, I would like to thank you all for going through this process and your willingness to serve our city in this capacity. Housing is very important to all of us. Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate our public comment? We are now taking public comments on item 3.1. If you are in the chambers and wish to make a comment and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial nine, star nine to raise your hand. You will have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert at the conclusion of that period. Mr. DeWitt. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, been a housing advocate for decades. And I wanted to make sure that you folks understood one thing that actually is mentioned in your housing element. It points out that there are 139 homeless veterans in Santa Rosa and that 65%, which is over 90, are totally unsheltered. So I just heard the comment from the gentleman from the United States Navy Air Branch. I want to thank him for his service, as along with Mr. Um, Owen, who's been on the Housing Authority already. I've attended a number of uh, Housing Authority meetings over all the decades. And what's really important, I think, is that you get some Housing Authority commissioners who understand the dynamic of actually putting housing in the downtown area, which the council has made a priority in the past, but the housing authority hasn't really prioritized and has actually been funding housing at the outskirts of Santa Rosa, on the far edges, building in the green fields, not doing downtown priority development with the money from the housing authority. Some projects take decades like Lantana, which took 13 years. So, we have this disconnect between the commissioners who get appointed 
and the council members who have priorities that they then set out for the staff and say this is what we're going to work on. So what I'm hoping is that whoever you pick today, you make a point of saying, hey, listen, this whole process is supposed to be about getting more affordable housing downtown. And that actually came to the forefront 60 years ago, 60 years ago, remember that, when our housing authority was actually founded because we needed more affordable rental residential housing in Santa Rosa. And it was basically here in the downtown area where we were destroying structurally sound businesses and buildings and built the towers that we have, Bethlehem Towers and Silvercrest. We need more of those tall buildings down here. The Housing Authority could help for that. And then one last thing, just a little aside. I've applied for the Housing Authority before, and I know my record should have been current and active. And I have a master's degree in city planning with a housing and community development focus. So I'm kind of curious why I wasn't in this round and where my paperwork went. It probably just maybe got shuffled aside with the new mayor and stuff. But keep it in mind, I'm always willing to volunteer. I'm coming down here to volunteer all the time. Thank you for your time. Zoom host, do we have any Zoom callers or any recorded messages? Excuse me, we do not have any hands raised as attendees. Thank you. And, oh, excuse me. Nope, it just went back down. We do not have any hand raised, nor do we have any pre-recorded messages. Thank you. So again, I would like to thank the applicants uh, for being here today, and uh, we will be voting on this matter a little later on um, during our regular meeting, uh, which will start at 4 o'clock. So um, we will now take a break until 4 o'clock where, we where we will resume our regular council meeting. Thank you.
Thank you. Seeing that it is 4 p.m. and we have a quorum, we will now begin our regular meeting for today, February 14th, 2023. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the roll. Yes, Council Member Stapp will remain absent for the remainder of the meeting. Council Member Rogers? Here. Council Member Okrepke? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor McDonald? Here. Mayor Rogers? Present. Let the record reflect all council members are present with the exception of Council Member Stapp. Thank you. We have no study session today. Um, no closed session to report on, no proclamation. So we are gonna go down to item 8.1. Um, Madam City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, our community empowerment update will be given by Danielle um, Gardino. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Can you speak um, into the mic a little bit? Yes. Better? All right. Haven't done this in a while. Okay, so I'm Danielle Gardunio with the Office of Community Engagement, here to give you a brief update on the Community Empowerment Plan, starting with the uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Spaces Mini Grant Program. We are set to launch the program as of April 1st. We're in the process of finalizing the application and uh, program materials that are associated with that. There will be $150,000 available um, through the end of this current fiscal year with another round of funding available July 1st. Um, applications will be available on a first come first serve basis and we will be working with uh, a review team on a quarterly basis to approve uh, the applications that we receive. Second update is the citywide internship program. Uh, we have a total of 10 um, available positions for uh, interns through this uh, citywide internship program. Our part participating city divisions include zero, community engagement and violence prevention, SRPD, planning, housing and community services, economic development, and our arts and public places program. Um, we have currently, at Community Engagement and Violence Prevention, have selected our two interns. They start on February 21st, and we'll be assisting our team with engagement and outreach activities, as well as activities pertaining to our department's strategic plans and evaluation efforts. Other departments are working on making their selections currently. And finally, next steps with the Community Empowerment Plan. Just as a, ref a refresher, um, there were a list of recommendations that were made to City Council in May of 2021 from our, through our listening session report. Um, these recommendations are non-public safety focused recommendations included creating an organizational culture that values public engagement with all community members and increasing access to public engagement opportunities. Commitment to inclusion, diversity, equity, transparency, and access. And mandatory trainings and educational session, sessions for city staff, appointed and elected officials, and members of our boards and commissions. Um, and through these recommendations, we've been working with the SEED Collaborative over the last few years, as you well know. And their work really dovetails with these recommendations, as well as the recommendations made in the resolution to declare racism a public health crisis. So we will continue to work with them and partner with HR and other city departments so that we can do a better job at implementing programs and services through an equity lens. And that is my report. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to public comment on that item. We are now taking public comments on item 8.1. If you are in the chambers and wish to make a comment and have not provided your name to the administrator, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You will have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert you at the conclusion of that period. Hello, 
My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm a firm believer in community empowerment, and many of the people in my neighborhood of Roseland have been hopeful that once we got a, um, as they called it, a community engagement department, that we would get some empowerment. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who haven't been able to participate as well as they might have liked, and there's not a real robust news sharing approach that's happening so that the people from the disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened neighborhoods of our city are able to actually participate and feel empowered. It's not really happening yet. I can appreciate that you've got staff and you've got people working on different things, but there needs to be a real world approach where the folks who actually are living and working in these uh, more unempowered neighborhoods are given opportunities in which they can become empowered. The dilemma that we face with any bureaucracy is typically that it's more about what the bureaucracy has in mind than the people in a community and what they think could occur. What we're hoping over in Roseland, especially now that after many years, a final annexation brought all of Roseland into the city, which is over 10,000 people when you actually look at the size of what was brought into Santa Rosa. And most of those folks don't really feel they get that chance to participate and feel empowered. As a matter of fact, I don't believe there's probably more than a few hundred maximum right now. Even though the departments are working on the things that they try to do, and even though there's this effort going forward, people feel, especially like in neighborhoods on West 9th and Link Street, Link Avenue, excuse me, that the gangs are more empowered than the city and the citizens. Gang graffiti is everywhere over there, especially on that corner fence. And then once you leave the graffiti there, it moves further to the east and it stays there. We used to believe that the city's taxes that were being paid into the violence, pretension, pr violence prevention task force, which was then going in to this new approach of what's happening recently just re uh, authorized that tax monies would help to empower the community, tamp down on the violence and the gang activities that are occurring in various parts of the city, Roseland, over there along Link Lane and uh, West 9th and other places. Those people feel like they're totally disempowered. They feel like they have no voice, no one's listening to them, and that our efforts on this community empowerment opportunity are not focused into what could be really helpful to the regular community members. So please take that to heart and give it a chance to help the regular members of the community. Zoom host, do we have any callers on Zoom or any recorded messages? There are no pre-recorded messages and there are no hands raised on Zoom. Oh, hold on. There's the panelist. No, there are no hands. Thank you very much. Okay. We will move on to item nine, city manager and city attorney's report. I have nothing to report this evening, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council, um, uh, Ms. Mayor and Council Members. Um, I did want to uh, at least uh, briefly alert uh, you that um, we are anticipating a change in remote participation in the rules governing remote participation in Council meetings. Um, we understand that the Governor will be um, terminating the uh, emergency, public health emergency due to COVID uh, at the end of this month. So starting in March, um, the provisions of AB uh, 361 that have uh, allowed you to participate remotely um, without uh, constraint, uh, those provisions will expire and we'll be back to um, a couple of, we have three paths um, absent the, the 361. So existing Brown Act provisions, um, we haven't been under those for a while, but uh, that is that uh, you can participate remotely. 
um, but your location um, must be posted on the agenda, the precise location where you'll be uh, participating from. Um, the meeting agenda must also be posted at the door of wherever you are in your remote location. And your location must be made open and accessible to the public. So if you're calling in from your home, you have to post the agenda on your front door and let people in and let people participate in the meeting from, uh, from your home. Uh, and the public has to have a, a means of participating. So for example, a speaker phone would work. Um, those have been uh, long in the Brown Act and those will be back, uh, back active now. Um, we do have two new paths, additional paths for participating remotely. Um, those are uh, uh, put into law through AB 2449, and that's that you can participate remotely for just cause or in emergency circumstances. So very briefly, just cause uh, includes a uh, need to care for a child or a parent or grandparent, uh, sibling, uh, and others. Um, or if you have a contagious illness um, that prevents you from attending in person, uh, or if you have a need that's related to a physical or mental disability to participate remotely, uh, or if you're on business uh, travel on business for the city or for another state or other, I mean, for the state or another local agency. If you want to use the Just Cause position um, provisions to participate remotely, um, you should notify the city clerk at the earliest opportunity um, and give a, just a general description of the circumstances that require you to participate um, remotely. Be aware you can only use that provision twice in any calendar year. Um, and in addition, at those meetings, if you do use that provision, you need to be participating both audio and by visual technology. Um, and if anyone is in the room with you uh, that is over the age of 18, you need to identify who that person is and what their relationship is to you. Um, second, um, or third, if you count the uh, pre-existing Brown Act provisions, um, is under the emergency circumstances. Emergency circumstances uh, are defined as any physical or family medical emergency that prevents you from participating in person. Um, again, you must, re in, in this case, it's not just that you have to notify the city clerk, you have to uh, give that notification but request permission to participate remotely and the council has to take action to uh, authorize uh, that remote per participation. And then the um, same rules apply. Um, it's not limited uh, in terms of to two meetings a year, um, but it is limited to no more than uh, three consecutive months or more than 20% um, of the meetings in any calendar year. And um, just as with the just cause provisions, you need to participate both um, by audio and visual uh, technology, and uh, you have to identify if there's someone in the room that's uh, over 18. Um, I wanted to, it will not apply to next your next meeting, but it will start to apply uh, in March. So I want to alert you to that, and I'll probably give you a shorter reminder uh, next time too. Thank you. And I have nothing uh, else to report. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Uh, we'll be taking public comment on that item. We are now taking public comments on item nine. If you are in the chambers and wish to make a comment and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert you at the conclusion of that period. Seeing no comments in the chambers, Zoom host, do we have any comments on Zoom or any pre-recorded messages? There are no pre-recorded messages and we do not have anyone on Zoom. Thank you. Moving on to statements of abstention by council members. Council member Okrepke. Okrepke. There you go. Uh, I'll be abstaining from 13.6 and 13.7 as I already voted on those at Planning Commission. Any additional? Looking online, seeing none. 
Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? We are now taking public comment on item 10. If you are in chambers and wish to make a comment and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert at the conclusion of that period. Seeing no comment in chambers, Zoom host, do we have any raised hands in Zoom or any recorded messages? No, there are no pre-recorded messages and no uh, hands raised in Zoom. Thank you. We will now move to item 11, mayor and council members reports. Do we have any reports? We'll start off with council member Rogers. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, since we last met, we had uh, Cinema Clean Power had their monthly meeting, their first one of the year. Just as a, a primer and a little bit of an update, we've been working through what's called the Geo Zone. It's a partnership between Sonoma Clean Power, uh, Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, and Marin County Board of Supervisors. And the goal is to create additional geothermal capacity for 500 megawatts of geothermal in the western region, I think is the best way to, to put it. Uh, we're currently in Sonoma County, one of the only places in the world that can do 24-7 renewable local energy. So the idea is to produce additional geothermal uh, capabilities. Uh, so far, we've partnered with one group out of Nevada for 16 megawatts. And at this meeting uh, last week, uh, we got an update on two more projects. One is an expansion of the existing contract with Calpine that's 25 megawatts. And then also uh, open mountain energy up in Bottle Rock in Lake County for an additional seven megawatts. Uh, we also, because it was the beginning of the year, set our rates that we had discussed in December. Uh, we pegged the rates for Sonoma Clean Power to 5% below PG&E's bundled rate for electricity. It'd be even lower if the state would fix the PCIA issue. Uh, and we can talk about that if, if council members need to. Uh, and then we modified our EV charger infrastructure program. So right now, anybody who is a member of Sonoma Clean Power can get 50% off a level two electric vehicle charger uh, before it's installed, and they get, get additional savings if they enroll in the Grid Savvy program. Uh, so the cost, if you were to be a Sonoma Clean Power member and invest in an EV charging infrastructure, uh, would be between $0 and $100 for you to install it based on which charger you select and whether you enroll in some of these programs. So good things for us to highlight for folks. Uh, we did see, we went over uh, looking at uh, $2.9 billion in dollars coming to uh, California from the California Energy Commission to expand EV infrastructure, and I know our staff is working on going after that. Uh, and we got our update from last year's car sales. Right now, California is 10% of the cars in the United States and represented 40% of the electric vehicles sold, including one out of every five cars here in Sonoma County. Uh, we also had SCTA RCPA where we released our 2022 annual report. We passed a model tree protection ordinance that'll be coming to each of the cities in the county uh, for discussion. Uh, and we got an update on a potential funding measure that's been worked on uh, moving forward for 2024. Uh, I also will report was reelected as the chair for SCTA RCPA at our meeting last week. Finally, today we had a special economic development subcommittee meeting where we heard uh, an update on our enhanced infrastructure finance district and just want to thank staff for their diligent work on that as well. Thank you, Council Member Rogers. Vice Mayor McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do want to make a few more appointments tonight. Um, Andrea Rodriguez will be continued to serve on the Community Advisory Board under my appointment, and I want to thank her for her continued service to our community. And Doug McKenzie will continue to serve on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board under my appointment, and I want to thank him for his continued service. And I will be appointing Omar Lopez to the Board of Community Service 
Omar is a new appointment and he is in his second year of political science, a student at the Santa Rosa Junior College. He lives in Santa Rosa since 2013 after moving from Mendocino County. Um, he's a super energetic member of our community and he is working for Generation Housing, a local nonprofit. Um, he's previously served as um, the Santa Rosa City Schools Board of Education as a student board member, so he has a background in governance and understands how to be prepared for these meetings. So he's worked on multiple um, campaigns, and, and he loves Santa Rosa and wants to be involved, and so I'm super happy to appoint him to this role. Um, I also attended the Park a Month, month event at Place to Play with Mayor Rogers. Um, I just want to say I was super helpful that day, and she can speak to that. Um, we, I also met with the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber and uh, recently attended the League of Cities conference in LA. And there I was able to um, complete my ethics training as well as have an overview of what they do for the California Cities Conference. Um, and we talked about their legislative conference that's coming up in April. Um, and it was great that we have our policy platforms that we just adopted. We're way ahead of the game. I do want to say congratulations to the Save Our Bennett Valley Golf Course Group for their recognition and receipt of a community service award. I was able to attend the California Parks and Recreation Annual Awards Banquet this past weekend and, and was able to see them receive that award. So congratulations to them and for being a bright spot in our community. And last night I was a speaker at Census Santa Rosa and um, met with Damon Connolly's office and recently had some onboarding meetings for the GSA as well as a violence prevention committee that I will be chairing. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Council Member Okrepke. Thank you. Um, a few weeks ago, I uh, was able to attend the dedication of UNAM, uh, the structure on uh, Courthouse Square. Um, the sculpture was is beautiful, it was a great event, um, and uh, then on February 2nd, I was able to attend the Housing 101 workshop put on by Generation Housing, or Gen H. Um, it was a very informative uh, uh, workshop on a multitude of issues when it comes to housing. Um, and then that evening, I was able to attend the uh, 2019 Employee Service Awards for the City of Santa Rosa. Um, that was a great event, including uh, recognizing 35 years of service of one Parks Department employee um, who didn't look like a, a day over 34 years of service. And then um, on the 4th, we went to the Farm Bureau Crab Feed, uh, the Great Sonoma Crab Feed. And uh, as always, that was a fantastic event and a good time. And then um, last week, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. on a personal trip, but was able to meet with our uh, legislative lobbying partners, uh, MMO, while I was there, um, and see the beautiful view from their offices over the Capitol, which is really cool. And then finally, I'm excited to talk uh, to announce that the city is kicking off a new cleanup and beautification program called Clean Santa Rosa. Uh, the first event will be in my district, District 6. Um, we will be gathering at the former Kmart site on Cleveland Avenue. Um, That'll be this Friday, the 17th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, 3771 Cleveland Ave. Um, Clean Santa Rosa is a, a great way for the community to get involved, to volunteer and join city staff to take care of our, our city and uh, show community support. Thank you, Councilwoman Roger. Oh, that w was me. Uh, Councilwoman Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Renewal Enterprise District met on Monday and we had our reorganization. David Rabbit will now be our chair and I will be our vice chair going forward. We uh, for finalized our commitment to continue moving toward um, extending our joint powers agreement to um, participate or to put ourselves out um, to jurisdictions for essential function bonds, which will allow jurisdictions in the region to eventually uh, place properties into trust to maintain them as affordable um, in a way that is um, more ethical and more affordable, frankly, than some of the more predatory joint powers um, that are operating in the area, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. And then the Metropolitan Transportation Commission met a couple weeks ago 
and we said goodbye to our outgoing executive director, Therese McMillan, and thanked her for her service. And we selected a new executive director, Andy Vermeer. And then um, there was one other thing, but, oh, now I remember what it is. Um, I'm going to be placing uh, Jorge Inocencio on the community advisory board for the Southwest position um, in agreement with um, Mr. Alvarez, Council Member Alvarez. And then I'll also be placing Devil Faulkner on the Art and Public Places um, board. So thank you all for being willing to serve. Thank you. Are there any additional reports from council members? Council member Alvarez? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just want to report that I've been in conversation with uh, former Senator Wessel out of San Diego, who's been very successful with uh, acquisition of funds for libraries, uh, philanthropic efforts, if, if, if anything. And um, he actually will be in town tomorrow on a separate visit. So I'm hoping to link up with him once again and really just educational purposes. So any of my fellow council members uh, respecting the Brown Act would like to join me for, for a conversation with him. I would be more than happy to uh, uh, bring you along and just learn about what works for him uh, in regards to acquiring funds through through private sectors and, and as well as federal and, and state uh, and just educating ourselves on uh, what could be done to for that heavy lift that is the library coming forth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my report is kind of lengthy, so I will try to get through it as fast as I can. Um, I too was at the UNAM dedication, and if you have not made it uh, to Courthouse Square to see it, please do. It is very beautiful. Um, definitely want to thank our Arts and Public Places uh, Committee that took charge of that and made it happen. So thank you very much. Um, I was able to participate in the point in time count. Um, if you have not done that, um, we need to do it twice a year. I mean, twice, once every two years, but we actually do it um, once a year. So, and that is where we count our unhoused that we have in our community. Um, it helps us to one, keep track of how we are doing to see if our numbers are increasing, decreasing, um, and if we need to go back to the drawing board to do something different. Um, so I was able to do that with uh, a lot of county employees, not so many city employees, but it was still uh, very fun. Um, WAC and TAC meeting um, on February 2nd was lobby day. Um, a delegation of Sonoma Water, WAC and TAC representatives held a Sacramento lobby day. Um, I attended and I met with staff from offices of Assembly Member uh, Connolly, Assembly Member Wood, Senator Dodd. Um, just to name a few, um, and the delegation met directly with Senator McGuire, along with executive staff on the California Department of Water Resources. Um, and we discussed um, regional issues such as forecast, um, informed reservoir operations, drought response, um, aging infrastructure, and groundwater sustainability issues. Um, the Russian River supply conditions um, is something that was discussed at the WAC and TAC meeting. Um, Sonoma Water staff provided a very optimistic water supply update. Um, will both with both reservoirs um, looking like they will be filled. Um, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers made flood releases from Lake Mendocino in January. So it is definitely looking up um, a lot brighter than it was about a month ago. Sonoma Waters, um, 2003-2004 water transmission system budget update was provided. Um, some Sonoma Water has been meeting with the TAC ad hoc finance subcommittee to review their proposed uh, fiscal year 2003-2004 uh, budget in the water transmission budget. Sonoma Water will be presenting their recommended budget to the Board of Public Utilities and the City Council for our review and potential recommendation in late March. And lastly, Sonoma Water infrastructure report. Um, technical staff provided two updates regarding 
their transition to new computerized maintenance and management systems in 2023 that will improve their system re reliability and shared a video that highlighted the completion of two um, retrofitted projects that will improve the overall system reliability for two locations. Um, so that is what's going on with water. Moving along to a, a park a month, I was able to participate um, at a place to play this past Saturday. Um, and would like to thank all the volunteers that did come out and also a special thank you to not only our community members that came out, but some of our staff that came out on their own time to help make the park look and feel like a much brighter place and a place that people really want to go to uh, to recreate. So thank you very much for that. Um, I was able to visit the vineyard at Fountain Grove. I had lunch with some seniors. Um, I learned about some of the issues that our seniors are facing now in our community um, and was able to take a tour of the facility. And lastly, I hope I'm getting to lastly, oh no, the Farm Bureau uh, crab feed was very delicious and very fun, a lot of networking, and I was able to see a lot of people that I know in the community, but also meet some people that I did not know. Um, the police department briefings, I was able to visit our police department. It was uh, two visits of, I hope, many to come, um, and I really enjoyed myself, and I want to thank them for inviting me and allowing me to come into their space. So that was very nice, and it was very nice to just sit down with them. We had some coffee and donuts, and it was great. So thank you very much for that. I would like to make some appointments. Um, so for Art in Public Places, the chair will be Ann Bumgartner. For Board of Community Services, Logan Pitts will be our chair. Community Advisory Board will be Callum Weeks. And for the Board of Public Utilities, I'm thankful that Dan Galvin will continue to serve as chair. Lastly, I have a little something here that I would like to read. Um, so please bear with me. Um, I would like to honor uh, Stephanie Williams, who will be retiring soon. Stephanie has been a valued employee for the city of Santa Rosa since 1992, when she was hired as a clerk typist for the utilities department. Stephanie has served in various roles, including sec secretary, confidential, administrative secretary, deputy city clerk, and now city clerk. This past year, Stephanie was so deservingly awarded the employee of the year in the city manager's office. Stephanie is the ultimate professional and is a prime example of a public servant. Stephanie, we wish you the best and your dedication and hard work will be missed. Thank you for a job well done. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for this. Um, I just want to say um, that it has been an honor to serve uh, the organization for 30 years, and especially to serve the council, this council and past councils um, throughout my career. You have, everyone has helped me grow personally and professionally over the past 30 years, and it has been a wonderful experience for me, and I definitely will miss everybody, but I will be kind of keeping my eye out and see what you guys are doing. But thank you so much for the recognition I do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just looking to council to see if there are any comments before we go to public comment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Madam City Clerk, may we please go to public comment. We are now taking public comments on item 11.1. .1. If you are in the chambers and wish to make a comment and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, 
please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You will have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert you at the conclusion of that period. Dwayne DeWitt, thank you Mayor Rogers for all of your outreach and going to the parks in person and participating, especially because Place to Play has been in the works for 25 years. We had a setup called the Santa Rosa Youth Athletic Field Trust put together before the turn of the century to help raise funds to get that place fully built. And as you could see while you were out there, it still needs a lot of tender loving care. I'm glad that you were there and I'm glad that you're looking at the other parks and you're involving other good people. Especially good people are the parks people. It's really uh, a difficult thing that our city doesn't have as many parks employees as we used to at the lower levels. And we don't even have a tree maintenance team like we used to have with 11 employees to take care of a lot of that stuff. So I'm hoping that you and all of your enthusiasm will keep on pushing to make our parks better and will reach out to give us even more young people of color, diversity in those jobs, those entry level parks and maintenance type jobs, which we really need. Thank you so much for your time and your efforts on all that you're doing and all the rest of you council members who also gave reports today. Thank you so much. Madam Mayor and members of the council and Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. You, you answered more emails <laughs> from friends of mine in a very timely and thorough manner. And that's what I think a clerk is all about. Uh, you've been a terrific intermediary between the community and the council and we're gonna miss you, but I'm gonna take you up on that offer to be uh, around to keep you an eye on us. Thank you. Seeing no other comments in the chambers, Zoom host, do we have any Zoom comments or recorded messages? No, there are no uh, pre-recorded messages and no hands raised on Zoom. Thank you. We'll now move to item 11.2 board commission and committee appointments. Today the council may vote to make an appointment to fill or to make three appointments to fill three at large positions for the housing authority each to serve a four year term set to expire on December 31st, 2026. At 3.30 today the council had the opportunity to interview four applicants, Andrew Smith, Jeremy Newton, Jeffrey Owen and Tony Neal. The purpose of the Housing Authority is to ensure adequate, decent, safe, and sanitary housing for qualified people within Santa Rosa, consistent with federal, state, and local laws. The Housing Authority primarily consists of Santa Rosa Housing Trust and Rental Housing Assistance Programs, both of which are responsible for improving the quality and affordability of housing in our city. I will now look to the council for a motion to fill the first of the three at-large vacancies or if you would like to do all three and we can agree upon that, is that? Uh, yes, you may make a motion either to fill one or to fill all three. Uh, and in the alternative, you may also conduct a uh, process of elimination if you prefer, but you may do it simply by motion. Perfect, looking at Council Member Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my first motion uh, for the first one is I'd like to move to reappoint Mr. Owen. Second. I'll second. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote?
Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Stapp being absent. Looking to fill the second at large vacancy. Council Member Okrepke? Uh, I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Jeremy Newton. Second. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Count Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Stapp being absent. And now we are looking to fill the third and final seat on the Housing Authority. Seeing no hands raised, um, I think the council is going to just uh, appoint the two seats that were voted upon and agreed upon. Thank you. And so if I can clarify, so your intent would be to leave the third position vacant? It looks like it. Uh, council, uh, Vice Mayor McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a clarifying question, and perhaps staff could um, let us know the process for going out for applications and then how applications are received so that um, the public is aware of this process and, and maybe we are a little bit more aware of that as well. I'd appreciate that. So we um, run a um, ad um, saying that we are soliciting applications from persons interested in serving on the Housing Authority. We run that through all of our social media channels and in the Press Democrat. And it is also posted online. That ad has the um, website link to fill out the, the application online. You can also submit a hard copy that we can you can mail in. And then once those applications are received, we give them to the council members um, to review. And then we will sch schedule um, interviews like we did today. And to, just to be clear on this, now that we have one spot vacant, will we have an opportunity to go back out again and uh, have applications open again for the public too? Yes, that was gonna be my question, if uh, council would like us to put out another recruitment ad for to solicit additional applications, we can do that. Do we need to make a motion for that or can we just direct staff to go back out again? You can just direct staff to go out and do that. Okay, we have another hand raised, so let me go to Councilwoman Flemings before we... Yes, thank you, Mayor. I have a, a question and then a suggestion. I, my question is, um, does having a vacancy create any issues in obtaining quorums to, to conduct the business of the Housing Authority? And the other question is, um, would the mayor find it reasonable that each member of the body might might choose between one of the two remaining applicants so that we could fill the slot this evening and forego the difficulty of, of putting that extra work on staff? Can we have staff answer the first question, please? Can you promote Director Bassinger, please? Good afternoon, this is Megan Bassinger, Director of Housing and Community Services. Council Member Fleming, can you please repeat the first question? Um, sure. 
The question is, um, does having a vacancy cause issues in reaching quorum or other administrative issues in the housing authority conducting their business? Uh, with the two appointments that you have made during the course of this meeting, we will have six out of seven positions filled. So I don't anticipate there being quorum issues. Ideally, we'd have a full uh, commission, but six out of seven will allow us to continue doing our business. Okay, thank you. Um, but it could allow for um, split votes and that sort of thing. Correct. Right. So then thank you very much, Ms. Massinger. My question is, would the mayor find my suggestion um, appropriate? Um, I would find your suggestion uh, appropriate. Uh, prior to going there, I would like to make a motion for Andrew Smith to be appointed. Second. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Council Member Rogers? No. Council Member Okrepke? No. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with four ayes, two no votes, and Council Member Stapp is absent. Thank you. I would like to take the time to thank all of the applicants and also to let the public know that there are additional uh, positions available on our boards and commissions. So if you wanted to take a look at that, we would more than welcome that we need to get those positions filled. So again, thank you to the applicants that apply for the, for the Housing Authority. And now, Ms. Move Ms. Mayor, before we move forward, I just want to note that the Housing Authority bylaws uh, do require uh, a resolution, so we will bring back a resolution at your next meeting on consent calendar with those three appointees. Perfect. Thank you. Madam City Attorney, because public comment was made initially during the interview process, is it? Correct. Thank you very much. We will now move to item 12, approval of minutes. We have 12.1, 12.2, 12.3, and those are minutes for November 15th, 2022, November 29th, 2022, and December 6th, 2022. Are there any corrections that council would like to make? Seeing none. Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment? We are now taking public comment on item 12. If you are in the chambers and wish to make a comment and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert at the conclusion of that period. Seeing no comment in chambers, Zoom host, do we have any comments on Zoom or any pre-recorded messages? There are no pre-recorded messages and no hands raised in Zoom. Thank you. Uh, we will adopt the minutes as presented. We will now move to our consent calendar, Madam City Clerk. Item 13.1 is a motion, authority to issue design build request for proposals for the Fulton Road Riparian Habitat Mitigation Project. Item 13.2 is a resolution, amended council policy 000-47, community promotion funds. Item 13.3 is a resolution, approval, second amendment to general services agreement, F002071, to extend the term 
of the contract and increase compensation with Matrix HG Incorporated for HVAC maintenance services. 13.4 is a resolution, approval of amendment to blanket purchase order 166149 with Smothers Parts International Incorporated, Santa Rosa, California for the purchase of automotive, automotive parts and supplies. Item 13.5 is a resolution, speed limits on Cross Creek Road. Item 13.6, ordinance adoption, second reading. Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa pre-zoning the properties located at 4646 Badger Road and 999 Middle Rincon Road, also identified as assessor's parcel numbers 182-120-034 and 182-120-035 respectively to the R-1-6 single family residential zoning district, file number ANX21-001. Item 13.7, ordinance adoption, second reading. Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa pre-zoning the property located at 1600 Manzanita Avenue, also identified as assessor's parcel number 181-030-005 to the RR-40-SR Rural Residential Scenic Road Combining District Zoning District File number ANX21-002, item 13.8 is a resolution making required monthly findings and authorizing the continued use of teleconferencing for public meetings of the City Council and all the City's boards, commissions and committees pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 until such time that the state and county declarations of public health emergency are lifted. Thank you. Bringing it back to council, are there any questions from the consent calendar? Council member Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. I've got some questions about item 13.2, please. And then I'd like to ask a couple questions about 13.3. Good we'll start with council member rogers thank you hello director yes hello um so for 13.2 i would like to um promote to the panel raisa de la rosa she is uh, available to answer questions on this item Raisa. So from my reading of the item, uh, the way that the process will work out for community funding is the council will approve a set amount each year in the budget. By eliminating council members from serving on the committee that reviews requests and also uh, a lot of the other folks that are on the committee, how will the public understand what the money has been spent on and what level of accountability will there be on the dollars? Sure. Um, so for one thing, what we definitely want to do, starting with the, um, the question about the amount. So it's not typical to have um, a program funding amount set by policy or within the policy. Um, and we were able to, well, not we weren't able to, but it was always done through the budget process anyway. Um, and so this gives council more flexibility with the funds, whether uh, it goes higher or lower. Um, so that's one thing. It's just uh, it's just taking the amount out of the policy itself. Um, the other thing is um, we wanted to allow for more transparency through the program. Uh, and uh, historically, there was only one council member um, that had served on the uh, selection panel, uh, and really it was only a, a few people from inside the city uh, who reviewed it. Um, so the 
uh, process itself will be more equitable um, as it'll be online uh, and we've clarified the process. Uh, and then the, um, the review of it um, and the budget allocations will still be done through council. So council will have an opportunity as it has in the past to still review um, what's being uh, awarded or what we're recommending to be awarded. Okay, so just to clarify, we'll set in the budget the total amount, but then each of the individual requests will still have to come back on the agenda so that the public can see what the dollars are being spent on. Um, if uh, I recall correctly, that's how we've done it in the past, and we're not proposing to change that process. I'm just looking for confirmation. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, Vice Mayor McDonald. Thank you so much. I just have a couple questions on item 13.3. Um, I see that this is um, HVAC coming, um, a, a contract that's being increased by $65,000. Have we looked at hiring um, our in-house maintenance workers to be able to service our HVAC equipment? And, and just for clarification, does this contract just include servicing belts, um, changing filters? Um, what else does this particular contract include? It says equipment if it breaks it replaces equipment but i'm assuming that that would be a different fee mayor rogers council members uh vice uh, mayor mcdonald um, my name is doug williams i'm the facility maintenance and operations coordinator um well i'll start with um the increase is not an increase of uh, sixty thousand dollars. It was it's it's a fifteen percent increase over last year. Two years ago, we went out for a, a request for proposals for a HVAC uh, contractor to do maintenance on our uh, HVAC units. Um, this is just uh, an extension. It was two years uh, guaranteed, and then three years. We come back each year um, with their proposal. We've been happy with their service and uh, the facilities staff. Um, and Matrix has, has worked really well. Uh, as for your question about in-house, uh, I have looked at that. Um, I called uh, the city of San Francisco, city of Oakland, city of San Jose, and they have what is called a, uh, a stationary engineer position, which is an HVAC technician, essentially. Um, we did look at that. The, the cost of that uh, was about the same as the uh, cost for an electrician. But at the time, it was decided that we were not creating new positions in the city and that we weren't uh, hiring new uh, folks at that time. Thank you for that clarification. And then just so I'm clear on the contract, is this for one building or how many buildings does this particular maintenance contract cover for our facilities? This is for all the general fund buildings. So it's gonna be all our fire stations, our rec buildings, uh, police station, city hall, um, MSC North, South. So basically all the general fund buildings. Thank you so much, Doug. I appreciate all the clarification. Not a problem. Looking to council to see if there are any additional questions. Looking online, seeing none. Council member Rogers and vice mayor McDonald, uh, did your questions get answered or are we looking at pulling any items? Thank you very much. Mayor, can I, can I just ask a clarifying question to Councilman Rogers? Are, are you comfortable with that process? So long as there's the accountability of being able to explain back to the public what we use the funds on. That's what I was, con the only thing I was concerned about is making sure if council members are not in the, the selection process, um, but have the opportunity and budget to talk about what it is for, and then there's reporting after the fact to the public on how it was used, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions um, or comments from the council members, we'll go to Madam City Clerk for a public comment. 
We are now taking public comments on item 13. If you wish to make a comment in person and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dying in, dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You will have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert you at the conclusion of that period. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. Two items, 13.2 and 13.8. 13.2, community promotion funds has been confusing to a number of members of the public in the past. It had seemed it had been basically a fund to help the Chamber of Commerce and other activities going forward in some sort of a, um, I guess many people in many parts of the community felt it was a locked box. You had to know somebody, to get something. And if you weren't in the know, nothing was coming your way. So with Measure O, which has a funding mechanism set up, and it always seems that it's the same folks getting money, there's many in the community that wonder, how does this all work? Mr. Rogers has pointed out that public awareness is important. Perhaps what should be done is there should be some sort of a mechanism in which you could actually have public workshops and tell the public how they could participate in the opportunity to gain funds for community promotion in their area, especially in disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened communities such as Roseland. Now looking at 13.8. One of the things that's been very helpful is that you do these meetings now in a hybrid manner. With the governor <clears throat> getting ready to end the uh, lockout, if you will, that has kept many people from participating, it was pointed out to me by one of the Zoomsters that I know that it's actually been more helpful for those folks who are Zoomers to be involved. Many folks don't want to come down here and sit around in a meeting and participate in the old civic kind of approach that was there back in the old days. They would prefer to have something where they could call in. And it's really been quite helpful to a number of people to make comments while sitting at home and relaxing at whatever time of the day these meetings might be going on. So I'm advocating <clears throat> that you keep this format going that you have now where people can call in, they can participate in this meeting without having to be here in person, but at the same time you allow all of the meetings that the city has, all public meetings, to be open once again to the public. That includes every committee small committees such as the Waterways Advisory Committee, which used to be open to the public. Get all of these things back open and then make it even better by allowing them to also have this new 21st century technological approach where you can zoom instead of boom, if you will. Us boomers got to come because we just feel comfortable with that. But as you go and you're going to zoom, let everybody participate as much as possible. And then one last thing. In the past, it's been mentioned that um, there used to be longer opportunities for people to participate and have public comment, up to five minutes in the past. When you have a meeting with not a lot of work, I don't think you should have a three-minute limit. Thank you. Seeing no additional comments in chambers, Zoom host, do we have any comments on Zoom? There are no comments, uh, pre-recorded comments, and there are no hands raised on Zoom. Thank you. Vice Mayor McDonald, can you please put a motion on the table? Yes, I'd like to move item 13.1 through 13.5 and item 13.8. Yeah. Second. M Ms. Mayor. Uh, may I also make a, a, a clarification? I know we do not engage uh, with um, on public comment, but I do want to note that um, although the restrictions that I mentioned earlier um, with the expiration of um, AB 361, those limitations respect are with respect to the council members themselves. The public, it is our intent to continue to operate hybrid for the public. So the public will still be able to participate without limitation uh, through Zoom and telephone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion. I'll second. And a second from Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote?
Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with six ayes, with Council Member Stapp being absent. I'd like to move item 13.6 and 13.7. Second. We have a motion from Vice Mayor McDonald and a second from Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Abstain. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with five ayes. Council Member Stapp is absent and Council Member Okrepke has abstained. We will now move to item 14, our public comment on non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for the public to speak to council on matters that are not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Madam City Clerk, may we please have public comment. We're now taking public comment on item 14, non-agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the council on matters not listed on the agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of council. If you wish to make a comment in person and have not provided your name to the administrator at the top of the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You'll have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert at the conclusion of that period. We'll take 12 speakers under item 14. If we have more than 12 public comments on item 14, the remaining speakers will be afforded an opportunity to speak on item 18, non-agenda matters, to provide public comment. Mr. Farron. Madam Mayor and members of the council, my name is Gregory Farron. A year and a half ago, I came before the council with uh, uh, an announcement that some of you knew about, but hardly any of us knew the, the impact it might have. It was called ARPA. And it brought to the council and to the county an awful lot of money that was flexible and that helped us solve a lot of problems and at least begin to address a few others. Uh, today I'd like to bring you another uh, announcement, a kind of Valentine president. Uh, some of you have been watching and listening to uh, what Congress uh, did subsequent to the CARES Act. The CARES Act was uh, contained the ARPA funds. Uh, but there are, were two other trillion dollar uh, legislative packages. Uh, and those uh, acronyms you probably should begin to listen to. One is called the BIL. It's the, it was the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Uh, and the other is called IRA. And it's, it was, it's now referred to as the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Both of those are going to give you a combined five times more money than you got from ARPA. Uh, you will be getting money for what, what the governor and a couple of other people uh, uh, sort of mentioned yesterday as uh, he, he has a council, the governor of California, called the uh, Cal ICH. And it's, uh, I attended a lot, it's called the California Interdepartmental Council on Homelessness. Cal ICH. Uh, there will now be a Cal IC everything else in government because uh, what didn't get funded under CARES Act, what didn't get funded uh, on homelessness, uh, and there are things like, as you know, bridges, roads, uh, <laughs> the uh, broadband, transportation, education, 
a whole lot of other things that you're responsible for and that you have ambitions for are going to be funded. The National Association of uh, Counties yesterday heard from seven additional special assistants to the president who will now join the cabinet heading departments larger than in some cases the existing departments uh, and uh, it was a, a wonder and uh, thrilling to a lot of us who have been uh, sort of championing the we can work with government to get things done uh, statement. Uh, some of you hold, uh, have known about the statement that people often deride government by saying, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, from the community point of view, we've always wanted to partner with you on lots of projects. Uh, we found ways of doing that, and I think these two bills, these, this bunch of money is going to make it a lot easier for us to do that. So uh, happy Valentine's Day. Next up will be Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Peter Allen. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. What I have here is a document from 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, on the 6th of May, right here in this building, right here at this place in this time, May 6th, 7.30 p.m., the Metropolitan Transportation Commission came to Santa Rosa to talk about how important it is to have housing in the core areas of a city and how if you have housing in the core area of a city, it makes things better than the urban sprawl that we've been doing all over Santa Rosa. As a matter of fact, many people in the Bay Area call this Sprawl Rosa because we've sprawled all the way out to Wood Avenue up by Fulton and all the way out past Bellevue and now we're gonna get ready to go take Moreland and go all the way down past Todd Road. You have to keep that in mind. If we're going to have this housing that you've talked about for 50 years, this core housing, not fringe housing, it's going to have to come with you folks having the political will to make sure that we get the higher density, the taller buildings here in downtown Santa Rosa like 50 years ago when they put in the Bell Bethlehem Towers, Silvercrest, the three tallest buildings in Santa Rosa are here near the core. They're for seniors. In Roseland, where I'm from, we need seniors housing. We came down here a while back and we talked with you about the lot that was right next to Exchange Bank on Sebastopol Road at Dutton Avenue, where a 12-story building could have been put in. But instead, city staff's allowing something that's probably only gonna be about four stories. So over there in that dense core area along Sebastopol Road where you could be having lots of housing, we're just getting lower level multifamily housing. And we're not getting anything at Roseland Village yet, where that community center was basically destroyed with the idea there would be some affordable housing in there, but that was 15 years ago. So now, a previous speaker mentioned the American Rescue Plan Act monies. That funding for infrastructure should be used there in Roseland, up on Sebastopol Road to help that project get done. You folks have allocated it to build out on the green fields to the far south of Roseland, a mile and a half away from the Roseland Commercial Core, the anchor to one of the largest communities in Santa Rosa, which has been neglected for over 50 years. The most disadvantaged, underserved, overburdened community cannot be disputed. It's in the county's records in the Portrait of Sonoma County Update 2021. This doesn't come from me. I'm just that messenger you don't like to hear. But don't shoot the messenger. How about we go out there and grab that big money that Mr. Fearon just said is going to be available from the big federal banks. Those guys that got the dough, they got the acronyms and they got the money. Please go get it and spend it in Roseland. Thank you. Next up will be Peter Allen followed by Tom LaPena.
First of all, I want to thank everyone at this meeting tonight for their service, especially coming to a meeting on Valentine's Day. I also appreciate the recent email from the city building official, chief building official, that the decision to leave the utility meters on the easement at 805 White Oak Drive has been postponed while he investigates the summary of our concerns. These were sent to the city council last Friday. I'll be sending pictures of the utility meters on an unimproved lot in our association showing their temporary construction along with pictures of the type of utility meters on a lot with a finished home at 805 Drive, uh, White Oak Drive and pictures of a similar in front of a previous house that, house that this homeowner built right next door with no temporary meters remaining in front of that home, just like all the other 129 homes in our association. Our other homeowners in our association want to know why this homeowner is being given special consideration to leave these meters where no one else has left them or been allowed to leave them, even though there are similar soil conditions and other lots in our community and in violation of the rules he agreed to when he moved here. This location also violates your codes, both city and state codes. Then we want to know what is so special about this individual that the city staff allowed temporary installation to be de declared permanent. Even worse, the city has recently declared that the private easements in our association that we have taken care of for over 40 years are now public without the proper legal steps in the California Code to make them public. After these 40 plus years, why does the city suddenly want to take responsibility for them? The city administration is claiming that the plain text of the city certificate on the subdivision map establishes these easements as public. However, this is a misapplication of, of this legal doctrine of plain language. The plain text of state code mandates a specific dedication and a specific purpose in plain text to be a public easement, none of which the city or anyone else has done. In summary, the plain text of the law overrules the plain text that the city is claiming justifies their actions. Otherwise, any statement in plain text could be used to violate the law. Therefore, a misinterpretation of the plain text of the subdivision map cannot be used to violate the plain text of city and state codes. I respectfully request the city to review its claim of plain text to justify its decision that private easements in our community are now public in light of the plain text of state and city codes. Thank you for your time. And again, best wishes for Valentine's Day. Thank you. Tom LaPena will be followed by Crystal England. My name is Tom LaPena. I'm the president of the Santa Rosa Manufactured Homeowners Association. I just wanted to remind the council, though I know you really don't need a reminder, you've probably been getting emails from my members. And I'm here to mention those five parks again that got left out as uh, I look at former Mayor Rogers and I remember at the last meeting how shocked he was when he found out that happened. And I don't blame anyone. I just want to get it fixed. And those parks are Cottingtown, that is in Councilman Okrepke's district, the country that's in Mayor Rogers' district, Mayor Natalie Rogers, and three parks that are in Councilman Alvarez's district, Roseland, Wayside Gardens, and Carriage Court. And uh, Mayor Natalie Rogers, I want to thank you for have, uh, agreeing to have a meeting with myself and Roger McConnell and Joanne Jones tomorrow to discuss that further. And Vice Mayor McDonald, I want to thank you for speaking at our December meeting. I wasn't there, unfortunately, as you know, but uh, I've heard that members could, would take you back as a speaker every month. And Councilwoman Fleming, I want to thank you for the long phone call that we had recently. And now that you have Santa Rosa as a village in your district, uh, they were very excited. But we've got another problem. I found it out just this Saturday. It's not clear on the city website, and this can be fixed very easily, what the new rent control amount is. Everyone who has gotten notifications 
from the owners of the parks is still getting 5.7 percent. If you look at the what was the old ordinance, it says annual rent increase, the CPI percentage change for the year ending of 21 is 3.7 percent. This year, it's a very nicely redrawn page with everything listed in attachments, but you have to jump from up here where the original ordinance is to down at the bottom to where the amendment is, and then you have to toggle back and forth between. Nowhere does it make it easy for senior residents to find out what their increase is. And I'm hearing through the Press Democrat that people are not sure what their new rent increases are. I looked at it myself and tried to find out. It's very hard. Please look at it and get it adjusted. Crystal England will be followed by Thomas Ells. Thank you for your time today. Um, my name is Crystal England. I'm sure that you guys have heard about um, the child who was hit on Hohen and is in critical condition. Um, I myself am a mother of four children. Um, I have two boys who go to Manzanita. And I'm here to ask you to please put cross school crosswalk safety on the agenda so that we can talk about this and come together as a community. In December of 2021, my son was also hit in his school crosswalk. Our school crosswalk has flashers, it has a median, and a crossing guard. And the car coasted through the crosswalk, hit my son. He, my son fell forward into the asphalt, smacked his head face down, and then the rear tire rolled over his back leg. A parent saw what happened and started laying on her horn trying to get the driver's attention. And the driver never stopped. She said she saw him look in his rearview mirror and throw up his hands like, what? And kept going. We never heard it from the police again regarding whether there was an investigation, whether they were pursuing it or not pursuing it, whether it was a closed case. Um, since then, even when my son was in a wheelchair with his broken leg, we were almost hit as I was wheeling him into the crosswalk. Again, flashers on. During reading night, again, flashers on. Cars flying through that crosswalk right in front of the school. Almost hit my husband who was carrying my two-year-old daughter. I did art docent, so you know maybe the car wasn't looking, but I saw a car, I put on the flashers. He had over 300 feet to slow down and he never took his foot off the gas pedal. He was going 45, 50 miles per hour in a large truck in a 35 mile per hour zone and almost hit me again. So this issue doesn't matter about what time of day it is. And it's more about distracted drivers and or indifferent drivers. And the flashing yellow lights send a level of ambiguity. We don't want them to, you know, be cautious of pedestrians. We want them to stop for pedestrians. So I'm here to ask to please adopt crosswalk safety policies that speak to our current realities. When the yellow flashers came out, that was for a less busy time with less distracted drivers. We don't want our drivers to slow down. We want them to stop. So if you could please put this issue on a further agenda so that we can come together and talk about this and keep our children safe. Thank you. Thomas Ells will be followed by Sandra Lemos. Hello, can you hear me? Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Happy New Year um, and, and uh, Valentine's Day as well. Uh, that's a really important issue. I think everyone in the city recognizes that uh, people are not stopping at crosswalks and they're very dangerous. Um, as, a, as a civil engineer and, and a traffic person, uh, those are very important issues. We, we're not controlling the speed of people driving at this time. They're, as she says, very distracted. But I came here to speak about something else and heard something very interesting from Gregory, which is obviously about these new uh, funds. And I, the, what I came to talk about is I'd like to speak with staff and so on, uh, potentially about creating another safe parking site within the city. So 
uh, the former mayor had in his district uh, uh, safe parking site developed and I think it's been uh, very effective and like to be able to talk about creating another one possibly using some of these funds that are coming down from the federal government uh, to be used for this type of housing not a giant place but certainly something that can move people forward in their in their housing uh, one other thing is that if we talk about sprawl what you can see here on the map is over here in Bennett Valley and, and out in Oakmont. Uh, well, I mean, that's the park there, actually. But then in Oakmont is where you can really see the sprawl. And one other thing that's happening is the Sonoma Developmental Center, which is kind of getting imported into it, according to the uh, Environmental Impact and Report and Specific Plan for, for Sonoma Developmental Center, is they're looking at having a very dense population of some 2,000 residents or so or more um, being sort of imported into um, the, the area of, that is consistent of the Sonoma Developmental Center, which would be effective, effectively like putting the downtown of Windsor there. They want to have three-story buildings. That was the type of thing. I was in uh, Santa Rosa's Leadership 15, and... Uh, that was about 1999, and there were people, Sam Salmon and Deb Fudge, and there were people that were involved in the leadership Santa Rosa at the time, and um, <clears throat> they were advocating Windsor and having a nice downtown and having a, a concentrated uh, uh, population there that could attract other services and so on and be a downtown. And that's exactly what they're putting at Sonoma Developmental Center is a downtown Windsor. And the problem with that is that you will have a force for sprawl out this direction much more than we have seen, especially in the valley that has been res resistant. And uh, we need to really be careful of that, cognizant. Thank you. Sandra Limos will be followed by Monica Zapata. Hi, my name is Sandra Lemus, and I am a um, resident of Santa Rosa City. Um, been here my entire life, so I definitely have seen the, the changes and the growth that we've had. Um, I'm also a mother of two. Um, ages from school age or actually middle school and co junior college age now, crazy to say that. But um, yeah, so so I'm here to also talk about the the, the focus of safe school crossings as well. Um, the other piece of me that I've also worked in the school systems for over 15 years from Rosen School Districts, Bellevue Unified School Districts, San Rosa City Schools as well. Um, and I have seen this issue come up um, several times in my time. Um, but what I'm just also here just to also support Christelle who just shared about her son, but it also just not only affects or impacts her life or her family's or her child's life, but it also impacts the school's community as well as other parents who walk their children to school. Um, here we are thinking that our children are safe walking into schools um, when you get that phone call when there's been an accident. Um, one that hits home to me um, is a former student of mine that was hit and tragically killed. Um, it was about 20 years ago, but it was um, just recently just kind of um, lifted it lifted it up again for me and um, I don't want to have to put up another uh, boulder with a plaque of a child's name on it um, tragically so we need to you know put our heads together and I ask that you guys um, that we put this agenda item on our list to work together to figure out um, how we can improve these situations but thank you Monica Hi, my name is Monica Zapata. Um, I am here to talk about crosswalk safety as well. I've been a resident of Santa Rosa for about four years now in my current home on Dutton Avenue, which is a hot spot for our crosswalks. Um, the reason why that intersection is so important to me is because I live between West College and West Third. And I, in the four years that I have lived on that crosswalk, I have witnessed two people get injured in the same crosswalk that is painted white on Dutton Avenue. And this issue is important to me because 
I witnessed the first tragedy of a teenager getting hit and I emailed the city about it and they did some work on, they put a camera up to see what they could do and the resolution to that incident was that they replaced a yellow sign with another yellow sign. And that made me feel enraged because the same thing was put to replace this sign. And in, since then, I've brought my seven-year-old daughter to come to a community meeting where Diana McDonald was there. We had another resident who is um, part of the council who was there, and she was able to put in her public comment about her safety because she walks to school with that crosswalk every day. And the other incident that has, pa that has happened was a man with his dog, and I could hear that dog squealing out my window and I could not hold it together for that one. I, I was just, I couldn't figure out what had happened because I couldn't even understand what was making that sound. And until I saw someone's car pulled all the way on the sidewalk, did I understand that someone had gotten hit in that sidewalk and they were working to help assist that person. My neighbor walks with rocks in his pockets because he is so worried about getting hit on the sidewalk, not just on the crosswalk, but on the sidewalk. He has run his own vehicle into another vehicle to stop traffic at that sidewalk. I am, I'm so sad and I'm so f afraid for the people who walk on that street every day, which is quite a few of them. And again, I just ask for to repeat the sentiment of really thinking about what kind of signage is going to be effective for streets that are this busy, for people and for bikes and for all of our community. Thank you so much for your time. If there's anyone else in the chamber that would make, like to make a comment, please make your way to the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Marta Valdez. I am a mother of a 17 years old daughter and a nine years old son. Thinking of my son who is special needs, I really feel hurry that something that happened like my friend Crystal England, it can be happening with my son, who right now might prepare him for being independent in this city. So I think you can have the opportunity to make the change. And all the kids in our community can be safe using something that is for them, the crosswalk. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Nancy Botello. I'm an employee at one of your schools, Santa Rosa City Schools. I start morning supervision out in the yard, the playground at 7.30, we have students crossing. There's a crosswalk that's visible from our playground. Many mornings I've heard the tires breaking of cars that have had to stop and seco because they are not giving themselves enough time or not paying attention that we have students crossing. We have a cross guard at that crosswalk. And it hurts to think of the possibility of one of my students being injured out there and how I'm gonna respond to all the other students that are there watching as this unfolds and I hope it doesn't happen but it's a matter of time so I ask and plead you put this on the agenda safer crosswalks and it's just for all our schools in Santa Rosa and everywhere else in Sonoma County thank you for listening do we have any additional speakers in the chambers
please speak into the microphone? Thank you. Is that better? Hello? Uh, key sites encouraging housing policies that improve the time, certainty, and cost of housing development by streamlining and reducing the cost of entitlements and permitting processes, including increasing by right development opportunities uh, to meet our local and regional housing needs. As you may know, uh, Keysight is an employer of over 1,500 full-time employees and another 500 contractors in Santa Rosa, and retaining and attracting talent uh, is, is a key critical area to our success and I think the success of the, the city, uh, but is a big challenge because of lack of housing for uh, new new employees that we would like to hire. So we're encouraging the council to include um, perhaps a high level staff person to align and coordinate departments with an eye towards increasing efficiency in the entitlement and permitting process, which could use some help, I'm sure you know, and a policy extending Santa Rosa's ADU fee structure to multifamily units uh, of the same size. Thank you very much. Seeing no additional speakers in the chambers. Zoom host, do we have calls on Zoom? We have uh, two hands raised. The first one is resident 6914. You've been allowed to talk, to speak, please. Resident 6914, you need to unmute yourself. I deeply apologize. Uh, this is Charles, the Spanish interpreter, uh, interpreting for your session. Um, I just wanted to ask the Zoom host, please um, add the other interpreter into the Spanish room, please. Okay. Uh, we don't have a, them available to add at this time. Uh, they are. Interpreter Renzo Mori is present, has been present. Yes, but he will, we are not able to add him when we go to interpretation. He must have signed in under a different email. Ah, I see. I understand. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry for interrupting. Uh -huh. Okay. We now have uh, Margaret Mail. You are allowed to, uh, you've been unmuted. Please speak. Hey, good evening, City Council and staff, Margaret DiMatteo, Housing Policy Attorney with Legal Aid of Sonoma County. Uh, I just wanted to hop on here and second Tom LaPena's concerns and let you know that uh, we at Legal Aid are trying to support mobile home residents um, with how much rent they should pay. Um, but what we're hearing is some park owners, even those that implemented a rent increase that took effect or will be taking effect after January 6th, um, are not issuing any notice of rent reduction and are refusing to answer inquiries about when tenants inquire as to whether their new rent will be the lower amended amount or 5.7% um, increase. So, you know, going on the cities, we can't direct them to the website because it's not been updated and it, you know, can add to the confusion. Uh, we do have a letter from uh, city attorney Jeff Burke that went out to mobile home parks, letting them know that the rent increase was effective after January or the rent decrease was effective after January 6th, um, regardless of whether when it was noticed. And if you haven't seen that letter, I encourage you to get a copy of it. That's the only guidance that we have. And that guidance flew in the face of what the residents believed, which is that the rent, the rent decrease would apply to all the parks um, via either retro, via either an urgency or a rent freeze. And I know, like Tom said, I'm not putting blame anywhere. I just want to know what the solution will be and let I'm able to inform tenants that there is a solution coming 
um, and we're happy to assist, provide, you know, ideas and options. And I just urge that if this doesn't come up before March 9th, that it be prioritized for the March 9th goal setting meeting. Um, and, you know, that that agenda be set forward in a way that residents can know whether or not they need to show up on the 9th or the 10th, since it is a two day event. Um, because, you know, most of them are senior and not all of them are able to get out and about. So it's a big deal when they do show up. Um, thank you. And, you know, thank you for continuing the opportunity to speak on Zoom. It does help people that have small children like myself. Um, and I will be back when you guys get to your regular calendar. But thanks so much for hearing me on this issue. There are no other speakers uh, with their hands raised on Zoom, and we have no pre-recorded messages. Thank you. Um, uh, we will be moving to our public hearing for tonight, but I would like to thank all of the uh, people that provided uh, public comment and to let you know that we have taken some notes and um, we look forward to working on some of the suggestions that we received. Uh, public hearing 16.1, Madam City Manager. Item 16.1, a general plan amendment, winter package, housing element update 2023 to 2031 and sequel addendum to 2035 general plan environmental impact report. Supervising Planner Amy Lau will lead the discussion. And if you could introduce your team uh, for the uh, record, thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much. Give us one moment to pull up the PowerPoint. And while they're preparing, I just wanna thank um, the city attorney or um, Ashley and Director Hartman for all the work that they've done uh, moving this forward. I know it was a lot of work, so it's great, greatly appreciated. All right, thank you for your patience there. I think we're in business. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Rogers and member of the council. My name is Amy Lyle. I'm supervising planner for our advanced planning team, which is the long range planning team. And this evening we're gonna be presenting our housing element for you uh, with a recommended adoption. And presenting tonight, we have um, a couple different people. One, we have Beatrice Guerrero Ana, who is our equity and public health planner. And um, then we also have Cynthia Walsh, uh, who is our consultant with PlaceWorks. Um, so we'll be breaking up the presentation uh, and hopefully making this go a little bit quicker and we'll be as succinct as possible. We are gonna provide a little bit of review just for context for um, the community members who may not have, have seen this presentation yet. Um, so this is very similar to what we presented with the Planning Commission um, last month on January 26th. So with that, um, I will note that um, this housing element is part of our Santa Rosa Forward General Plan Update Project. So the housing element before you tonight is an eight year snapshot in time, whereas the general plan is looking at 2050, so a much longer horizon. Um, so this is part of the process, but pulled out um, to move on a faster track. Um, but we are still working on the general plan update, which will be, um, be coming before you later this year. All right, so for tonight, uh, we're gonna give you a little bit of review over what is required as part of the housing element, um, the process and where we've been, and what is in the housing element, and then um, what our recommendation is this evening and what the next steps are. 
I will say the, the housing element itself is a ras rather thick document. Um, we hope that you all did get that hard copy. We do have summary documents, which are just a synopsis. It is all of the policies and programs, but then um, a little synopsis of the chapters within that housing element. So we do have copies of the summary in English and Spanish for the community here tonight. So they are up at the, the desk near the front door. Um, and of course, that's online as well. And I should note that online, there's multiple versions of the housing element. So we do have the housing element that's before you. We also have a version where you can track the various changes that have occurred over the last year. Um, and so those are annotated um, with highlights where comments have been incorporated in response to the state and then in track changes um, where there's comments in response to community comments and um, other engagement efforts. So, um, and then we also have the summary in English and Spanish on the website as well as well as all the comments that we've received to date. Okay, so um, the housing element, I should also note, is one piece of the complex puzzle related to housing. It is the policy document that will be in place for eight years that really um, set the, the programs um, and all the other zoning code updates and work that would occur come under this document. So it is not here to solve everything, but it is one vital piece of that puzzle. Much of this document is uh, state mandated. There are, um, especially in recent years, a lot of legislation around housing and what needs to be included within a jurisdiction's housing element. It is one of the only pieces of our general plan, uh, really any local land use authority, that has to go through a state process. So it does um, get eventual certification by the state um, and review throughout. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that process has been for us and um, what, um, how that actually works. So I'll also note that we have been working collaboratively with other jurisdictions. We have a um, grant through Association of Bay Area Governments uh, to have a housing collaborative. So we worked jointly with the jurisdictions from Sonoma and Napa County, supported by a consultant team. So we've been able to do additional outreach, have a lot more coordinated discussions around policy and housing. And um, so that has been a major um, add a uh, value add to our process. All right, so this slide is um, not going to go through this in detail, um, but this is really uh, just a snapshot on the timeline of where we've been. There have been significant changes to state law, especially since we've started the process. So the, it's been a bit of a moving target as far as what needs to be in the element, how much review goes into it, and uh, what this process is. And um, we really started this process when we received our housing allocation numbers. So that's our regional housing needs allocation, ARENA. So we'll be talking about that uh, a little bit more. But once we received our allocation, which in this case is 4,685 units, that really provided us the information that we could go and then draft the general or this general plan element with. Um, we did kick this off with a study session in 2021. And then um, the process throughout has been in partnership with HCD. So we did work with them and had um, them review our housing element. Their, our draft was submitted to them after public comment and they took a full 90 days to review that. We've also had informal discussions with HCD uh, and that's housing community development, making sure I'm not using too many acronyms. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that when we get to tonight and the submission to, to them for that final certification, that we have anticipated public comments, um, anticipated needs from HCD, um, and that we uh, can go through this next review and, and get a certified housing element. So I do just want to note that um, since we started the process, a few things have occurred. So one was AB 215, which went into effect in January of 2022. 
Um, this law expanded the timeline for HCD review without adjusting the final deadline for the housing element certification. So now it essentially needs to be completed 74 days earlier than previously required. So that also means that um, our housing element had to be posted for public comment for at least 30 days for our initial draft. Um, and that we had to wait 10 days or two weeks after comments were received from, um, from that co public comment period before submitting an initial draft to HCD. And HCD now has 90 days to review a housing element instead of the 60 for the last cycle. And all of this remains with the same adoption um, deadline of January 31st, 2023. There were also uh, a lot of um, back and forth over arena numbers at ABAG. So that, that process did track late. So we did, um, we were anticipating the number, but we did not have those final numbers. In addition, the 2021 legislation increased the requirements with affirmatively furthering fair housing. And so this is relating to a whole new section that's required in the housing element. And that guidance from HCD did not come to us until late 2021. So there were a variety of different things, um, shifts and pivots that we had to make. Um, we were very fortunate in that we had a consultant under contract already for our general plan update. And they were one of the two um, consultant groups in the state at the time who knew how to specifically write uh, the AFFH or Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Report. So, and I will say that because of the myriad of new laws that HCD has to implement, and there's a large number of statutory requirements that HCD has to deal with at their um, layer of government. And so most of the housing elements reviewed, about 90%, require a second round of review. So although we submitted our housing element um, hoping to be on track on time in, in uh, August, we were hoping for a conditional certification letter. They did request um, another round of review and provided us comments. So the draft that you have tonight includes the comments from, um, that we've incorporated for HCD's review. And then we also have within your staff report the itemized list of uh, requested changes that came out of our planning commission hearing last month. So with that, I'll turn it over to Beatrice to highlight our outreach efforts. Thank you, Amy. Good evening, uh, City Council members, um, community members, and staff who are present in the meeting today. Uh, one of the um, essential parts of the housing element was a public outreach. This was required by the um, by the state, and uh, we did uh, all the requested items that the state was uh, was requesting through through the law, um, starting with service provider interviews, uh, City Council and Planning Commission study sessions community workshops that happened during March 2022, and we had a, an online community service uh, survey, as well as uh, a participation on the Napa Sonoma Collaborative as, um, Equity Working Group, as Amy was mentioning. Besides this, uh, the housing um, element conversation was included in the Santa Rosa Forward uh, Community Involvement Strategy, so all the comments provided by the community through the preferred alternative, vision of the city, and um, Alternatives uh, processes were included in this in this housing element too. Were provided um, to the group that was working on this housing element and included. Um, and if I can add to. Um, to the housing element uh, public outreach, we also had additional steps beyond state law. And this included creating a specific uh, website for the housing element, which can can be found in uh, santarosaforward.com. Uh, we created bilingual social media campaigns together with our, our communications team. And we had bilingual pop-ups in equity priority communities. Uh, this means uh, coming out to communities that usually don't show up to, to community, um, to public meetings and um, set a table and uh, by equity priority communities we uh, are referring to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission methodology on identifying census tracts that are both low income and uh, 
with a high percentage of people of color. Additional to this, we created channels of communication that were more accessible for, for community members. We used the Let's Connect platform to um, include our, our draft and receive comments from the community. We opened our text messages and WhatsApp uh, channels to be able to receive comments from the community too. Um, once we submitted the first draft, we heard from, from community organizations that they wanted um, different requests in relationship to housing policy as well as time for reviewing the, the drafts. And uh, we had additional meetings uh, during December focused on uh, providing information and fostering co collaboration in terms of the outreach that we created. Uh, and finally, during this timeline, uh, while we were uh, submitting um, the, the changes uh, that HCD required to our housing element, we were also creating a bilingual housing element summary. Um, since we couldn't translate the whole document because that was $11,000 for us to translate, we, um, we decided to make a summary of this uh, document to make it more accessible for our community members so that they could access uh, this document, and we decided to translate that document into Spanish. So that um, is a document that we have upstairs in case any of our community members wants to see it. And uh, we also have to say that this document is very unique since we are the only city in the state that went ahead of what the state required and created a document that was accessible for community members and that was translated into Spanish or into a different language. Um, thank you, Amy. I'll, I'll let you continue. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail on this slide, but just to say that these are all the components of the housing element before you tonight. So we're going to go through these chapters very briefly and we'll focus on the, the policies and programs a little bit later in the presentation. So first, we wanted to give you a little bit of information on the RENA, um, so the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Um, again, this was a process that was headed by ABAG and included all of our um, jurisdictions in the Nine County Bay Area, and ultimately what our allocation uh, ended to be is 4,685 units. And so this slide is really showing you that there is a breakdown in how we um, are asked to produce these units. Um, they're not just all moderate or all above moderate. They are um, very specific as far as what income levels the housing needs to be created for. And this includes almost 2,000 units for our low income brackets. Um, so we can come back to the slide if you would like, but just to let you know that it is um, broken down into different incomes. So for us specifically, um, this is how we are um, within the context of the Sonoma County region. So um, a lot of the other cities have been grappling with the same issues of um, how to accommodate their allocation within their cities. Um, a lot of their uh, arena allocation numbers have increased. Um, so we are actually in a very good place because we don't need to rezone property to be able to meet this allocation. So we'll walk through that as well. And then just a very quick highlight on our past cycles. Um, so we are in our sixth cycle right now. The last cycle, which is the fifth cycle, um, ended the end of last year. And we are working on those um, 2022 numbers. Um, but I will say our, our housing count is around 1,100 units. Um, so we still will not meet our arena for the last cycle. Um, but again, there is a significant need to increase the amount of units in those low income categories. Um, we have been able to produce the housing on above moderate categories. Um, I'll also note that this does not include any uh, fire rebuilds. So those are, are counted as existing units as those rebuild. And then looking back a little bit further, here are the two um, previous cycles before our last one, um, just giving you some, some information about how uh, well we've done or not well we've done. Um, as I've noted, the housing element is one piece of the puzzle. We have no control over what comes in the door or um, what production occurs. We do as much as we possibly can with your leadership to streamline housing, to provide incentives. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the challenges come down to funding and um, you know, the actual projects themselves. 
All right, so moving into what the other chapters are in the housing element. Um, the first uh, chapter is the housing needs assessment. And so this is really a deep dive of data. It's a very demographic heavy. Um, it is a snapshot in time, so it is. Uh, this was released in June of last year, and a lot of the information was based on the available data at that time and the available census data at that time. So um, just to give you a little primer of what's in this, I just pulled out some of the major um, highlights in my mind that are important to note. Um, one, that we saw a huge increase in overcrowded units between 2010 and 2019. This has been an increasing area of highlight around the state um, because that does really um, lead to um, substandard living conditions and um, a lot of unsafe situations. And so we are experiencing that in Santa Rosa. Um, we do believe that the 4% of units being overcrowded is an undercount. And so that will be um, you know, a focus over the coming years. Interestingly, 46% uh, of our households are renters. And 62% 60 of our households have families and are not just single, um, single people living within a home. And then I'll turn it over to Beatrice to talk about fair housing. Thank you, Amy. Um, for, the first, uh, for the first time, the fair housing assessment was required in housing elements, and this uh, came um, up to, to, the, to the state's uh, regulation in April 2022. So this is pretty recent, and um, the city had to analyze six different, uh, char six different characteristics that are, were relevant to understand what are the main barriers to fair housing. And one of this is racial diversity, household income, rates of poverty, rates of overcrowding, overpayment, and family status as well as rates of disability. Uh, we included in, in this slide just um, as, uh, a graphic of, of a portrait of Sonoma showing the differences in between um, 2014 and 2021 in relationship to the um, Human Development Index. This index actually takes into account housing, which is a, a big part of, of um, the portrait of Sonoma uh, analysis. And we can say here that there's two groups um, that we see in, in the city of Santa Rosa having issues uh, with human development index, and this is black and Asian populations. And we want to point this out because it's not visible during, uh, during the analysis that we made in the, in the uh, diversity composition index. And we want to um, talk a little bit more about that and what was discovered in the fair housing assessment. So in relationship to that, um, I, I want to bring up some of the, um, some of the main um, things that we addressed during, the, during this uh, fair housing analysis. Number one, um, in terms of race and ethnicity, Highway 101 actually serves as a physical barrier that separates the city into two different uh, sites, east and west, and uh, the east side is uh, less diverse and home to the city, city's most affluent households, while the west side uh, reflects more diversity both in terms of race and ethnicity, as well as income. And um, uh, for, for, for this same um, topic, Santa Rosa's non-white communities are clustered in southern uh, and southwestern Santa Rosa, primarily in uh, mixed commercial and residential areas uh, south of uh, Highway 12 and east of Stony Point Road. Additionally to this, um, we found that um, the highest diversity in the city is uh, found on lower resourced areas, and um, that uh, this regional, these patterns are not only um, happening in Santa Rosa, this, these are regional patterns that are happening across the county and across the, the uh, greater Bay Area. So um, just to add to this, Western Santa Rosa is considered a low resource, resource area, while most of the eastern um, side of Santa Rosa is moderate to hide resources. So uh, this is something that we uh, identified through the uh, fair housing assessment and that we also addressed in the policies included in the document. So important just to, to mention that this is a new part of the, of the housing element that was not consi considered before and that um, also gave us a lot of feedback in terms of the communities that we had not been uh, engaging in the past. And just to add to the conversation of, of engagement, uh, we have had more than 42% of people who were renters responding to, to our um, community engagement efforts, as well as people who um, own businesses in Santa Rosa, uh, majorly uh, live in Santa Rosa, but also um, 
a, a greater racial diversity in the survey responses, including 2% of um, Asian communities, 2% of uh, Black and African American communities, as well as 15.3% of Latin uh, of Latinx or Hispanic members of the community. And just to to add up to this, uh, we had a fair distribution of age in the in the responses that we had uh, through our engagement, except for people uh, under 17 years old, which were, was the only group that we did not we were not able to address. And just this this is just um, some additional uh, points to the to the not only diversity com uh, com composition of the city, but also uh, how uh, we are addressing the comments and uh, integrating uh, requests that the community members uh, ask us for in this in this part of uh, fair housing um, part of the housing element. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we will move on to the next section of the housing element, which is the housing sites analysis. So this is directly related to that RENA number. So this is uh, showing that we have the ability and the capacity to be able to meet that 4,600 number. And um, again, we do not have to rezone any sites. Um, this is not a likely development pattern. This is recognizing our existing capacity to be able to fulfill that allocation. We are engaged in the general plan update, which does um, provide a better community-driven process and a snapshot of a larger trajectory of how our population will grow and change over time. Um, it is certainly in concert with this housing element, but this is just identifying existing capacity. There will be increases and in intensities of development, um, but in areas that are driven by our areas of change and our priority development areas, as noted in the, the larger general plan effort. So the site inventory does include projects that are pending, that have been approved, and are under construction. So we are able to take um, projects that had building permits issued as of July last year into this cycle. So this is really just providing the map showing where those projects are and at what amounts. And then we look at the vacant property, um, and this is split between downtown and non-downtown, um, and that's primarily because our downtown specific plan has no density. We have floor area ratio, which is, uh, it's been a challenge to work with the state on this because they are looking for certainty that projects will develop at a certain density. So we took a very conservative approach to show what certain projects have been doing in the downtown and not putting um, a lot of um, numbers associated with our downtown plan within our housing element. And um, as you know, the downtown plan uh, was adopted and um, able to um, consider up to 7,000 units. So for this eight-year period of time, we are only suggesting that the capacity is 1,300 units, um, which may or may not be the case, um, but that is the capacity that we have been able to work with HCD on um, as far as what densities we can show and what types of housing units can be developed downtown. So outside of downtown, um, we do have a range of different sizes of properties and the different types of projects. HCD is very particular about the size of, of the properties um, and the different components of the site on how it will be developed as a lower income site, moderate or above moderate. Um, so this really reflects a lot of back and forth and um, review with HCD. Um, and we are counting some of those properties that have not yet rebuilt. That is allowed within the cycle to recognize that existing capacity. As you may remember when we came to your council last June, um, that was a question is if we wanted to identify the sites within those wildland urban interfaces that have the potential to rebuild knowing that those property uh, value or those property rights still exist. The other piece of this is projecting how many ADUs will develop. Those are our accessory dwelling units. Um, we've had a lot of success in the city with promoting our ADUs and uh, especially with our rebuilds, um, adding those 
those units. And so these have been, um, we have taken a conservative approach as well, looking at the annual average that we have done over time and what we can likely do based on the capacity we have over the next eight years. And, um, and we also have to show a breakdown of income amongst our, our ADUs um, in, with that ABEG methodology as you see on this slide. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia, um, who is our consultant and who has helped us draft this, this document tonight. Uh, thank you, Amy. Good evening, Cynthia Walsh with PlaceWorks. I'm just gonna jump right in. So another section of the housing element is the housing constraint section. And this is where we look at both governmental constraints and non-governmental constraints. And governmental meaning we're looking at the city's fees, the processing times and the procedures, allowable uses, um, things like that, that, things that the city has control over. We also look at non-governmental constraints, and these are things such as the cost of land, availability of financing, and construction costs. We also include information on energy conservation, identifying available programs that are out there, as well as the city's practices. Next slide. So for the evaluation of the previous housing element, um, the review of the previous housing element section is where we look at the city's progress towards implementing each of your programs from the prior planning period. So for the fifth cycle. So once we've reviewed where the progress that has been made, we determine the next steps for each program. So should the program be continued? Should it be modified? Or should it be removed because it's been completed? Next slide. Um, looking at the housing element goals, you can see we have six overarching goals that are aimed to encourage housing development, address special needs groups, um, such as large families, female-headed households, persons experiencing homelessness, persons with disabilities, uh, farm workers. And then um, we also have ensuring equal housing opportunities, looking at ways to reduce or remove governmental constraints, and developing energy-efficient residential units. Next slide. So here you can see that the six cycle housing element has 42 actions, also called programs sometimes. So of those 42 programs or actions, I apologize, um, there are seven that are continuing. There are 19 that are modified. Modified meaning a majority of the program most likely remains the same. The funding could be modified or the time frame could be modified on those. And then we have 16 new programs that are, that are new to the housing element. And these are typically based off of new state law requirements. So ensuring that we're meeting all of the new requirements there. And it's also, in, they're also included to support um, analysis. So if we have our sites inventory where we wanna include additional programs to strengthen our analysis, we would have new programs there. Next slide. So the next few slides, we're gonna just kind of quickly walk through what the different programs are. All of these obviously are detailed in the housing element with timeframes, funding, and responsible parties. So you can see here, these are our continuing programs. So again, these are carryovers from the fifth cycle document. We're looking at adequate sites. This is ensuring that the city will maintain sites to meet arena throughout the planning period. Um, looking at opportunity development areas, the Santa Rosa Housing Trust Fund, uh, housing for large households. A large household is where there's five or more persons. Um, build community acceptance, real property transfer tax, and participation in the mortgage credit certificate program. Next slide. So now we'll jump into our modified program. So again, most of these were, all of these were in the fifth cycle housing element, and then they were modified to continue to be relevant for this current cycle. So we're looking at encouraging mixed use projects, um, as Amy mentioned, accessory dwelling units, code enforcement activities, housing rehab, those also uh, kind of play together, mobile home park preservation, uh, preservation of at-risk housing. At-risk are housing units that are um, converting to market rate within 10 years. So we've identified actions there. Uh, the inclusionary housing program, support affordable housing development overall and funding for affordable housing development. So our modified programs continued. Um, there's several programs aimed at special needs groups, as I mentioned, persons with disabilities, farm workers, persons experiencing homelessness, extremely low income households, senior households. 
Uh, we also have fair housing services as a program, tenant protection, eviction prevention measures, Section 8 housing choice voucher program, application for streamlining and compliance with, with SB 35, and then energy efficiency in residential development. Next slide. And then last, we have our new programs. So as I mentioned, several of these programs are either to address new state law or to help strengthen our analysis in the document. So you can see we have lot consolidations, small site development, innovative housing options, large lot development and subdivision. These are all gonna help boost up our analysis for the site's inventory. Looking at completing a housing condition survey, this would give the city an idea of where the rehab needs really are within this, the community. Mobile home park rent control, affordable housing tracking, and essential housing bond financing program. We also have the pro housing designation, which is a big one. Um, on this slide, the first two programs, H30 and H31, the fair housing, um, as Beatrice mentioned, so 8686 is a brand new section of the housing element. So there are some rather lengthy programs to address the fair housing needs. So both 30 and 31, we're looking at anti-displacement strategies and place-based revitalization strategies. We also have a new program for a community land trust program. We have our zoning code amendments. That's where the state law requirements come into play looking at revising parking standards, design review findings, and then water and wastewater priority for affordable housing development. Next slide. I think I'm gonna hand this back over to Amy. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so I'm actually not gonna go through this slide because we did go through a lot of the detail of where we've been um, with HCD uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so I will say for our next steps, if your council adopts tonight, um, we will be submitting the housing element to HCD. Um, they do have 60 days to be able to review the document. We hope they will take less time. We have, we will be planning to request an expedited review. Um, we have submitted um, the draft before you to them last week um, to get a head start and to ask for their informal review um, before your adoption. And um, so, we will be in full compliance under state law once we have a certification by HCD. Um, so there is a, a gap in time until that occurs. So during this time period, there's a couple different things that we want to make sure you're aware of. Um, and under state law, that means that one, we may have potential impact to being uh, able to apply for different grants around the state. Um, we. To give you more context along with all the complexity of the state laws that have changed, I will say we are not alone. We are, um, there are only four jurisdictions in the nine county Bay Area that are currently un in compliance with certified housing elements. In Southern California, a year and a half after their deadline, approximately 46% of them are in compliance. So the state funding opportunities have shifted what we're seeing is instead of asking for a certified housing element at application, they now say certified housing element at the time of award um, because there's simply not enough jurisdictions in compliance to be able to be able to um, provide grant funds. The other piece is something called the builder's remedy. Um, so I know you may have heard about this in the news as well. And what this does is it provides additional streamlining for affordable housing projects. So it's our position that it, with your adoption tonight and with the findings that we have in our housing element resolution, that this streamlining opportunity and the other penalties would not apply after tonight. And that's because the resolution before you uh, does say that we are in full compliance with state law based on HCD's review and their letter that they provided and the changes that we've made um, that you'll be uh, hopefully adopting tonight. And that is consistent with the ABEG guidance as well. Um, and so with that, I will also note that the 
resolution that we are hoping you adopt tonight um, also includes the ability for um, staff to make minor revisions as necessary to the um, to the housing element. So if they do find minor things within their review, that we would have the ability to make those changes without having to go back through a full adoption process. So um, that is something that we will have to assess once we get those final comments from HCD, which we hope will just be a certification letter. So this housing element tonight um, is uh, certainly a project under CEQA, and so there is an addendum as part of your package, and this is an adoption um, opportunity relying on our existing general plan EIR. Um, this is primarily possible because we are not changing any land use or zoning as part of this. This is a policy document that is a recognizing the existing capacity that we have and is in line with our existing general plan. It will be, um, as this is a general plan amendment, will become part of our existing general plan. We will be continuing to work on our general plan update and making sure that all of the policies drafted um, do um, are consistent and are um, in concert with this housing element. So there, there may be changes on the horizon as we work through um, the full comprehensive update um, and certainly opportunities to incorporate um, non-housing things that m help create these complete communities and look at infrastructure and other needs. So it's our staff recommendation tonight um, that you hold a public hearing and consider two resolutions. There's The first resolution would be approving the addendum to the general plan or environmental impact report. And the second would be adopting um, a resolution to adopt our um, housing element as part of the winter general plan um, amendment package. So I'll also note that there is some late correspondence that you've received. So um, most of that was posted midday today. And we do uh, have one letter that I'm not sure posted, and that is from Generation Housing. So we do have physical copies of that for you this evening um, to make sure that's in the record as well. Um, I will note that the Generation Housing letter does um, acknowledge and single us out as um, one of the jurisdictions that did provide additional time, um, the only jurisdiction in Sonoma County to provide additional time um, for their, um, their review as well as the um, collection of um, housing element commenters that we've worked with as far as stakeholders. And we're of course ready to respond to any of the comments and any of the late correspondence um, as, as you would like. So with that, I will conclude and turn it back over to you, Mayor Rogers. Thank you all for your presentation and for being with us tonight. Um, are there any questions of staff from council members? Council Member Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so first of all, I did want to thank everybody for all of the work that's gone into this. I know that it's one of the more difficult and lengthy community engagement processes that we see across the city. But I did want to ask one uh, question for me, one disconnect uh, is between slide 15 and slide 18. So slide 15, as we talked about, is the disadvantaged areas of the city. Slide 18 is where we are citing projects that are outside the downtown specific plan. And it, one of the things that's most striking to me is that we are not proposing or we're not identifying a single site in Northeast Santa Rosa. And again, even outside of the very high fire severity zones, but we don't have a single one that is identified as being low income or proposed to be low income, even when our own report shows us that we already have an over concentration of where, uh, where poverty and where um, uh, different demographics exist in our community. I'm wondering if you can just respond to that. Yes, and I'll ask Cynthia to weigh in as well. Um, but that is, um, you're absolutely correct. And part of that is because of the methodology that we have to use to identify sites. So HCD is very specific about what a site is required to have to be able to con um, accommodate um, a lower income or a fully affordable project. And so we just don't have the abundance of large sites within the Northeast area, and that's one of the primary issues. 
Our sites have been reviewed in accordance with our fair housing policy as well, and that's one of the lenses that HCD reviews our sites with, is to make sure that we are um, looking equitably throughout the community as far as the distribution. And we actually did incorporate uh, programs related to not having enough large sites available for um, so some of those projects that we would like to see in the Northeast. But um, Cynthia, do you want to um, elaborate on anything? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so really at this point with the housing element, this is just a, a land exercise. So we are looking at what's currently zoned appropriate. And as Amy mentioned, HCD ties density to affordability until it becomes an actual project. So we are taking an inventory of the sites that are zoned at different at varying densities and then allocating them towards each different income category. So as these develop, they could develop differently. This is just based off of this initial analysis looking at density and affordability. I would like to add something else, uh, Council Member Rogers. In relationship to this, uh, we also are uh, going through the uh, general plan update part. And if you um, go back to the to the final uh, draft of our of our uh, preferred alternative, there's actually areas of change in the east of the city which are addressing this uh, this uh, this changes of, of zoning in the future, which will help us uh, with policy after this eight year cycle. Because this is this is only for for the next eight years with within the general plan update we're planning for the next 50 so our um, expectation would be now that we get to the other part in terms of land use to change what we have right now on the east side of the city so that would be a next step and one more add-on is that that map was showing the vacant land capacity if you look at um, I can find the slide but the map showing the approved or under construction um, capacity we do have 100 percent affordable projects occurring on the east side um, a couple under construction at, at right now are there any additional questions from council members yeah, I still had one additional question. Go for it. Uh, can you talk us through a little bit the pro-housing designation, what it is, how we anticipate to get it, and why we would want it? Yes, great question. Um, so your council did approve a resolution allowing us to apply for the pro-housing designation. So that application is underway right now. Um, it is an application to HCD. It's the same set of reviewers. and. Basically, what that designation provides is additional opportunities for funding. Um, the legislature is layering on other um, incentives around that pro-housing designation, but to, to date, our uh, compliance with housing law and our ability to pr produce units has really been tied to our ability to um, show success of those arena numbers and the success of actual housing being produced. But we know that jurisdictions don't always control the market. We don't control the market or the production. So the pro-housing designation is really trying to move that incentive to, to jurisdictions that have policies in place to streamline housing, um, to in, encourage housing um, in all different ways. So there's four categories of policy area that HCD is looking at. And um, there's so far only a handful of properties have or jurisdictions have received the pro housing designation. So we hope to apply for that and it will coincide with our um, certification of the housing element. Um, but that will put us in line for additional incentives as we move forward. Um, I will say we have to keep the pro housing designation. So it is not you get it and you have it forever. Um, we will have to show progress towards that designation that we are actively um, moving on the draft policies which are part of the application or um, and continuing the programs that we have in place. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. And I'll have comments at the end. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from council members? None here, none online. All right, we will now open the public hearing. Madam City Clerk, may you please conduct public comment? We are now taking public comments on item 16.1. If you're in the chambers, we'll first call on those speakers who have signed up with the administrator at the top of the stairs. We will then ask anyone who's not signed up to make your way to a podium. 
If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You will have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer will alert you at the conclusion of that period. First up, we will have Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Bob Harder. Yes, thank you for your consideration. Sir, can you please state your name? Thank you so much. My name is Adrian Covert, um, uh, head of, oh, taller than I thought. Um, my name is Adrian Covert. I'm local lead for Santa Rosa Yimby, member, uh, a resident of the West End, father of said young child. Um, happy Valentine's Day. There's a lot to commend about the city, about this housing element. This is a very difficult process. A lot of cities in California are having a very hard time meeting the state's new standards. So there's a lot to work with here and commend city staff and the consultant for doing a lot of great outreach to our all-volunteer group that's dedicated to pro-housing affordability, pro-livability, pro-sustainability, and our housing development. So thank you. Nevertheless, four key inputs. One, we believe the city should probably look at scrapping the inclusionary, so-called inclusionary ordinance. There's a lot of new research out from HUD and others that show that inclusionary ordinances increase housing costs over what they would be without the ordinance in place. And the city of Santa Rosa has already had to ratchet down its inclusionary ordinance to prevent housing production from being stopped. So that's number one. Oh, and I would just add to that, you know, common sense here. We don't tax schools to make education more affordable. We shouldn't be taxing housing to make housing more affordable. It doesn't work. Number two, we should eliminate car parking minimums citywide. Uh, we've already done it in the downtown area and the areas around the smart stations. Minimum parking uh, ordinances increase the cost of housing. Uh, prolong car dependency, they violate our climate goals, they violate our Vision Zero goals. Let's be on the right side of history here. Cities are doing this across California. We should do it here and be uh, a bit more visionary on that front, and we can do that in the housing element. Three, when it comes to bikes, please don't force me to drive places that I would rather not drive. Um, and I'm not alone. A lot of people would like to bike places, but they don't feel safe doing it because there isn't the adequate infrastructure in place, not enough support. And the housing element where this can be addressed is in parking minimums for bikes, particularly multifamily housing. Uh, we strongly encourage uh, city staff to work with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board on strengthening, bringing the uh, bike minimum parking on multifamily to one-to-one, -to -one, and particularly getting some minimum standards on e-bike parking. E-bikes are a really attractive way to eliminate about 20% of road trips that are currently taken by car in the city. Um, but they have specific safety uh, and charging requirements. So please look into adding that to the housing element as well. And then lastly, uh, strengthening the pro-housing designation. Long story short, the benefits of the designation are strong, but they're gonna get a lot more competitive as more cities in California angle for this designation. So please work with staff to maximize the amount of points that we can get, because it's really important. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm a member of the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group, which has been in place for over 27 years advocating for affordable housing. This is a nice aspirational document, but there are some inadequacies. Congratulations to all the magnificent seven women that worked on it. There's all this good stuff going, but as usual with a big document, there's some open spaces. I'm very supportive, and so is the HAG of these new opportunity development areas, all of the new uh, programs that are being put forward, the community land trusts, specifically the downtown specific area specific plan is a really good thing, and that's where a lot of this housing should go. Thank you to Mr. Chris Rogers for his comments about East Santa Rosa. It's really important to remember that El Noca and the Southeast Greenway are large sites which should have a lot of affordable housing put into them. And that needs to be mentioned in these types of documents. The uh, idea of going forward for a pro-housing designation is very nice. 
the political will is what it usually takes. And that's been the dilemma in the past. As you'll look back through the documents, you'll see we've never really had a problem providing housing for above moderate income. That's always been able to happen. And that's not a problem for the rich people to find a place to live. Or the problem is, is for the people who are below moderate income, extremely low income people specifically. And that's where we need to really focus our efforts to make sure that we are housing these people and we're actually having actual units produced. If you encourage housing, encourage it for those who are the most vulnerable, extremely low income, very low income, low income. Go right there, build thousands upon thousands upon thousands of units because we shouldn't have any homeless people in this community, which is in one of the richest places in the United States of America. There's billions of dollars in Sonoma County. Let's make sure and house our people. And then one thing that doesn't get mentioned much is it's passed over, vacant units are at 5%. So if we have 70,000 housing units, think of those vacant units. That's thousands upon thousands of housing units that should be in use. There's never, never enough time to go deeply into all this on what we need, but the downtown area has been supposedly the focus for at least 30 years. And that's where we need to go, where the city owns properties. And plans have already been put in place that sit on shelves for the White House property across from the post office, things of that nature, your parking lots, etc. You can take the lead. You can be the folks, the new council, the new mayor. Go for it. Don't be bashful. Go out there and house people. As the old people used to say, build, build, build. I say, house, house, house. Let's go for helping those who are less unfortunate. Bob Harder will be followed by Lauren Fury. Hi, my name is Bob Harder, 9327 Lakewood Drive, Windsor. I apologize in advance for uh, my voice, for some medical things I'm dealing with. I'm here to speak in favor of your adoption of the general plan and the amendments and really want to address what I think you need to do to fight for achieving it and to, vent and to defend against those who will try to sabotage it. I've been working on city, Santa Rosa, county of Sonoma, town of Windsor, general plans and housing elements since the 1970s. What they share in common is a sincere belief to achieve their goals, which have gotten more challenging through the years as properties more expensive, et cetera. What they also share is their failure to meet the goals, generally speaking. That's not new news. But here's my thought on why that has happened. As shown in your slides, and it's gotten worse, I'll say, through the years, about half of our housing needs are for renters who don't tend to rent 4,000 square foot homes at Fountain Grove. Most of our production has been the above moderate, generally 2,000 houses a year and 2,000 more affordable housing generally for renters. What comes through the door, as staff said, has been, continues to be, I'll say except for Hugh Futrell, single family homes. And I've been in the development business a long time. That's what I would build, because I can build it, sell it, and walk away from the place. That's what single family home developers are in the business for, like doing, and most neighbors support. So the two cautions I have is one, defend this, especially with regard to density and houses per unit. Single family home neighborhoods don't want renters near them, NIMBY. Renters don't want high rise near them. Then you get into splitting. Condominiums who are owners 
don't want renters near them. It's rental owner sense. And as you can see, we're mostly renters. So guard against their concerns, which are legitimate and maybe more difficult for you now with districts and developers who come in and only want to build lower density and will encourage you to forget about the higher density these lands are zoned sometimes and encourage you with neighbor Thank you. support to Thank you. build less. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Lauren Fury, followed by Evan Wig. Uh, good evening, council members and members of the public. Generation Housing's 2021 report found that Sonoma County needs 58,000 new homes by 2030, with the lion's share of that need here in Santa Rosa. Our city is uniquely poised in the county to set ambitious housing goals. We have undeveloped space within city limits, sufficient infrastructure, transit options, including three smart stations, and as a largely flat city, we have the opportunity, opportunity to create a safe, efficient bike and pedestrian network that spans the city and supports denser housing development. The current housing element is an opportunity to lay the bedrock for achieving these ambitious housing goals. I wanna thank this council and especially the city staff who have put enormous effort into this housing element draft and for all the work done to engage our community in the development of the draft and the wider general plan effort. I also want to implore both council and staff to make several critical changes to the housing element draft before adopting it so we don't miss this window to propel Santa Rosa's future into a new, denser, and more equitable direction. Uh, one, please consider eliminating the inclusionary housing requirements. Research has shown that inclusionary housing disincentivizes new housing production in areas with high housing costs relative to rents. Santa Rosa has Bay Area costs, but not Bay Area rents, which makes the financial feasibility of new housing developments more challenging here than elsewhere. Adding inclusionary requirements, which further reduce rental income on a property or add capital costs in the form of in-lieu fees, makes the financing of new construction even more daunting. We need new construction to be financially viable, to increase the housing supply here in Santa Rosa and make rents more affordable for everyone. Beyond direct costs to new developments, inclusionary housing burdens city staff with the implementation and monitoring of small numbers of restricted affordable units spread across many different buildings. As a 2021 Press Democrat article on the Vineyard Creek Apartments exposed, monitoring and enforcement of, cur of current inclusionary units is already a significant challenge here in Santa Rosa. Two, uh, we recommend eliminating parking requirements throughout the city as other cities have already done and Santa Rosa itself has already done in the downtown core. Requirements that prioritize cars over people and other forms of transit is in direct conflict with the city's climate and vision zero goals. Three, increase bike parking minimums to at least one secured bike parking spot per dwelling unit throughout the city. Also develop and adopt minimum e-bike e parking requirements for new construction since this is a, an increasingly affordable and efficient way of moving through cities. Four, aim for a, a higher pro-housing designation score since some funding programs are already ranking pro-housing designation pro-housing designated cities, including the new pro-housing pilot incentive program. And five, ensure that the forthcoming transportation element is drafted in consultation with the Santa Rosa Bike and Ped Board. Thank you. Evan Wig, followed by Alexa Forrester. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Wig. I'm a resident here in Sa at Santa Rosa. Um, and I just first off want to thank uh, the staff. Uh, I've been able to have conversations with several of them over uh, over the last uh, year or so at meetings and a uh, number of uh, events. So it, they've done incredibly responsive. So I really appreciate that and all the work that's been done to, uh, to really encourage uh, development of housing and particularly affordable housing and a more livable community here in Santa Rosa. Um, the one thing I wanted to really focus on uh, today is um, we have different elements and obviously in order to tackle something like a general plan it's incredibly complicated we can't do everything all at once so we separate them out into elements uh, my concern is that you you miss the opportunities for uh, to really make sure that things are synthesized uh, what I also heard from the staff tonight which was reassuring is that after this is uh, uh, approved there is still opportunity to make sure that the elements are, are in concert and two things the two elements that I'm hoping uh, staff 
uh, can really make sure are actually in concert is the housing elements and the transportation uh, element to make sure that you know, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, allow for housing development without thinking: Are there roads there? Um, are there stop signs there? Um, are, are are there driveways available? Right? Um, but we don't have that same thought about uh, bicycle infrastructure. Um, we have. We, I, what my request then is that as we develop uh, this general plan in a larger sense, that we're really thinking about connectivity uh, and, and not just, you know, first we do the housing element and then we figure out, you know, where we want to put some bicycle paths, but really thinking about housing where people are, or transportation where people live. The ability, if we're going to be allowing for housing in one area, is there safe uh, a transportation routes? We heard earlier tonight a whole bunch of uh, really concerned people about the safety of their children, and I can tell you there's a number of places uh, throughout the, 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 this city that it's just unsafe and the reason why people don't bike is they're they're nervous right and so how can we make the average person moms and children and uh, just an average person uh, not just like diehard bikers right um, not like the biker game that we showed up here the night but like just normal everyday people to see that transport that you can actually live a life without parking requirements for development that's another point uh, so you've, you've already heard that one um, but you can actually live a, a, a full uh, and, and sustainable life here in Santa Rosa without a car uh, and that's going to require that density that that uh, we're being we're, we're working towards as part of this housing element but it's also going to require the transportation um, I infrastructure. So I do hope that those things get in concert. Uh, and the last thing I'm just going to throw in there is uh, program H6, Innovative and Alternative Housing. Um, I hope that, that you guys uh, dig a little further into that, not just sort of like consider the options of, but for instance, uh, making movable tiny homes to be considered ADUs, cooperative housing, all those opportunities to really broaden your horizons about what can be uh, housing here in, in Santa Rosa. Thank you so much. Alexa Forrester and then Gregory Fearon. Hi, is this on? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hi, I'm Alexa Forrester. Um, I am a mother of a 15-year-old and a just recently turned 12-year-old. And I'm a professor at the JC. And those two lenses um, have made me care about some things very deeply um, that I love. And I'm bringing them here because I love this city so much that I'm spending Valentine's Day with my city. So the things that I really care deeply about are the city's adopted Vision Zero safety goals. I want my sons are Spring Lake Middle students, and in addition to the student that's currently in the hospital still from being hit in the past two years, students have been hit on bicycles. Um, Spring Lake Middle students have been hit on bicycles as well, and that um, motivated me and my husband and a number of our neighbors to collaborate to form the campaign Bikeable Santa Rosa, and we've been uh, very appreciative for the council's response to our. Um, reaching out to you about that. The other goal is equity goals. Um, many of my students at the JC struggle to complete college because of transportation issues and because of the lack of affordable housing um, for them. And then, of course, climate goals, because when you have kids and you think about what is Sonoma County going to look like 40 years from now, is this going to be a safe place for them to live? All of these things inform my vision for the future of Santa Rosa. And there are a number of ways that those intersect with the general plan, you know, overall, and then the housing element in particular. So I just want to endorse everything that's been said by Adrian and Lauren and Evan and other speakers tonight about um, the you know, and, and the gratitude, especially for the language justice component and making sure that everybody has access to this. Um, but I want to, to especially endorse the, uh, the removal of parking minimums across the city, not just in the downtown core. If you are requiring development developers to put parking minimums in their housing structures, you are admitting defeat. You are admitting that you have designed a city where there, it's impossible to live without a car. I think people should have the right to drive their cars. I think we should make it safe for them, but you shouldn't force people to drive and you shouldn't force people to bear the costs of car infrastructure if they want to choose not to drive. I also want to just um, advocate for what Evan was saying about making sure that the housing element gets um, integrated and worked work systemically with the transportation and circulation elements when those come before you. Um, thanks for your time. Happy Valentine's Day. 
Gregory Fearon will be followed by Kristen Kiefer. Gregory Fearon, um, I want to say this is uh, dreams. Uh, some part of me says it's a, a fiction, but I want to support it nevertheless with some exceptions. Uh, it's clear, and if you read it, and I know you all have, that most of the low income, and I mean not $50,000 a year, but folks making 30 and 20 and 10, will never have any impact from anything you're doing in this book. They are not going to get places to live in, and you know it. Now, the other thing I want to say is everything this guy said in front of the lectern here, Paul Harder, I totally agree with. Every single word he said is true. And the third thing I want to point out is all of this comment about in lieu fees and, and uh, you know, inclusionary zoning, you wouldn't have the 5,000 units that Burbank and Midpen and EEH and anybody else built without that funding. I don't understand their perception that somehow the money for low-income housing, which is what Burbank's been trying to do, would fall from the sky somewhere. It doesn't happen. They point to one source, the bonds. We've tried bonds, and every time it comes up, every time they put it on the ballot, it has nothing to do with real low-income housing. Now, because affordability is a huge stretch, We've now gained over the last 20 years a lot of people who think they can't afford housing. From the folks that we used to say were down and out to everybody. We are a community that has only a few people who can afford to have a home ownership and a whole lot of people who are struggling to just be renters. Market does not produce without pressure anything for what I would call affordable. And the only tool you have to get affordable is to browbeat them into doing what we've done for the last 20 years. Have those who pay more help pay for those who can't. That's what it's all about. That's what your inclusionary and in lieu fee is all about. And God bless you, Fitzrell, because he's one of the few people who buys into that. Thank you. Kristen Kiefer will be followed by Cliff Wingham. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and honorable members of city council and our city staff. Thank you for hosting this public hearing tonight and for hearing all of our comments from the public. I want to appreciate give time to appreciate all the work that has gone into this housing element update. Although I do want to point out that there is still work that can be done to make these city policies more impactful. I want to voice support for continuing programs that make development of ADUs more flexible. I will admit that from an outsider's perspective, the convoluted process can be daunting and there can be more done to boost those numbers of producing more ADUs, especially on properties in historic preservation districts, specifically in the station area specific plan. I would also like to support programs to relook at lot consolidation and small site development the opportunities for zoning code amendments will give opportunities for flexibility that can increase the number of housing units that we have available to renters and homeowners. I want to applaud the rate at which multifamily development has been approved by city staff and that has been in the process of being constructed. Yet I do notice that many of these developments are located on the outskirts of town or outside the station area specific plan, plan boundary. This is concerning to me as this does not align with city policies and goals to address climate change. Reliance on private automobiles continues to be a strain on families in Santa Rosa and does not further goals and strategies to address climate change. Look at 
More, a lot has been written about the hidden cost of housing and owning an, a private automobile is on the top of the list. Also, I am a cyclist and I want to continue being a cyclist and to feel safe that when I commute to work, that is my decision for my health, for my community, to be a better steward of our community, but also I want to feel safe on our streets. The bike paths are great, but there can be so much done uh, by looking at the um, bike and pedestrian advisory boards plans and advisorship to this council. I would also like to reevaluate, have this council and city staff reevaluate the fees and regulations regarding smaller developments or rehabilitation projects. Uh, permitting and impact fees are often impediments to creating different sizes of units and opportunities that fit into the missing middle or mid-size projects that could provide anywhere from two to, you know, two to eight units on a smaller lot. Uh, thank you again for this time and I hope you have a great evening and consider making amendments before the approval. Cliff Wingham will be followed by Thomas Ells. Hello, my name is Cliff Wingham. I'm addressed to you not only as the organizer of the Gateway Properties, but also as one of the property owners in the Roberts District. I bought my property in 2006. Six months later, it was rezoned from light industrial to TVR, uh, 25 to 40 units per acre. In 2016, I formed the Gateway Coalition uh, to uh, help defeat the Redwood Gospel Mission Homeless Project. And at that time, I organized the property owners to market the properties. We had a developer interested in it, but the environmental issues came up. We secured a grant from the EPA through the count CDC of uh, Sonoma County and we did the environmentals, which we completed November 20th, 2020. Uh, the city of Santa Rosa rezoned our properties six weeks later to the now unrealistic 6.0 floor area ratio. I understand the housing element plan is uh, to identify where housing can be built. I had identified the gateway properties, it's 10 acres in total, uh, at 2540, uh, good for 400 units of affordable workforce and market rate housing. That's a reasonable density that can be built. Anything over 40 units requires basically structured parking. I know there's no parking minimum, but the reality is that 90% of the people in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County own cars, even if they take the bus. They will own a car and no developer or financial institution will support development without parking of some kind. A reduced parking would work if we were to put uh, possibly 50 or 60 units to the acre with uh, reduced parking, uh, supporting things like studio apartments and double occupancy two bedroom apartments. That would economically work and not require the structured parking. The core density of downtown, the density works because there's parking structures. Uh, Santa, uh, Southwest does not have any parking structures. Southwest is a depressed area that needs affordable housing. Roberts is technically on the south side of Highway 12, which puts it in Southwest, not as part of Railroad Square. The homeless encampments have been a plague on the Roberts district. I, Organize the uh, police and public works to clear the homeless seven out of the late, last eight years. Anyway, there's my spiel. I hope you read the letter I sent you. Thomas Ells will be next. And then anyone that hasn't checked in, if you'd like to speak, please make your way to the podium. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, over the years, I've come before the city council in order to speak about Southeast Greenway, and that is great to save that property and use it as a parkland, but the area to the north uh, is 
primarily rental property and uh, should be upzoned for the uh, for the future, so that you can have infill there and even you know um, redevelopment that would raise the height of those buildings, have access to that park and that greenway, and that's your safe access for bicycles and pedestrians and so on to the to the core of the city. A good deal could be done there. I think the point that I'm making is that I'm surprised, well, I'm not surprised, uh, but I would ask you to consider zoning as a part of this housing element, that you go forward with, with amended zoning and uh, zone changes because this is an amendment to the general plan. So you don't have to stick with your existing general plan and the zoning that you have. This is the opportunity for you to change some of the zoning within the city. Uh, some consolidation of zoning, particularly with regard to commercial type zones. There's so many different kinds of commercial zones and everything. It's very, very confusing. Uh, and in particular, one aspect of that zoning is that the city approved for up to 50% of housing to occupy commercial property if it was in general commercial zones. So the city approved that. But the interpretation was that that must fall within a specific zone called commercial general, which is only about less than one-tenth of the commercial property within the city. So it's very specific that general commercial means all commercial, does not mean commercial general zoning under a specific zoning. So I would look at that number one and then 50% of those uh, square footage could be converted to, to housing. But specifically also within this particular housing element is you can utilize this for zone changing. I would recommend that you approve this later after you get those you know conditionally after you get zone changes because you can have the approval of this for at the time of funding all the types of of uh housing that you're looking for so you can delay that and get your zoning change if you want thank you if there are any additional speakers in the chambers please make your way to the podium Seeing none, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our Zoom host to facilitate. Oh. Do we, we do have uh, some hands raised. The first one will be uh, Margaret. If you can unmute, you are next, followed by Joshua. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay, hi, it's Margaret Zamadio again with um, Legal Aid of Sonoma County. I'm just calling to um, predominantly express support for the housing element plan. Uh, I want to thank staff and planning for um, giving our seemingly uh, coalition. We sent a letter around asking for additional time to analyze and respond to the housing element draft, and they've been really accommodating. And, you know, we just, we really appreciate that because our coalition group, which is made up of a lot of different sectors, uh, we have been working really hard on analyzing all the housing element plans across the county. Um, and so uh, we appreciate that. And um, I just wanted to note that uh, Legal Aid had submitted a letter in December um, regarding some changes to the housing element draft primarily around fair housing and tenant protections. Um, and I'll note program H32 looks to be um, the area that the the city will look to when formulating policy around preventing displacement and tenant protections. Um, so around that though, I would just encourage you to consider more specific language 
um, you know, the housing element is supposed to be um, have attainable and measurable uh, goals and specific. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, tenant displacement and eviction protection, you know, we know that the city funds, you know, eviction defense, and we appreciate that. Legal Aid is the primary um, nonprofit that provides that free legal assistance to low income tenants facing their loss of housing. Um, and we encourage that to continue. Um, but, you know, having that ability to have an attorney in court doesn't necessarily prevent the loss of housing because in the absence of local protections, closing um, loopholes in state protections of tenants, and there are several, uh, there's not much that, there's not as much that we can do to keep people housed as we could if there was, you know, just cause eviction protections like Petaluma is adopting, um, like Sonoma, the city of Sonoma has put into their housing element plan. They've also put in uh, a rent registry and rent stabilization in the city of Sonoma. They're the only jurisdiction in the county to do so. And I would urge you to at least consider what what they're looking at. Um, and then, you know, predominantly, I would support the commentary of Gen Housing. Uh, I don't disfavor the inclusionary housing policy. I think it was um, it's intended not as a solution to everything, but as part of the solution. And, you know, it was designed to address um, zoning practices such as redlining. Uh, and so it doesn't go. Okay, we will now hear from uh, Joshua. You can unmute yourself. Um, great. Thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor McDonald, and council members and staff. My name is Josh Shipper, and I am the Director of Special Initiatives with uh, Generation Housing. Um, we we want to applaud the progress made on Santa Rosa's housing element, um, with special thanks to Director Hartman and Amy Lyle and the planning team. Um, Cal Weeks uh, personally asked that I pass along his gratitude for your work, uh, having worked with all of you over the past uh, year as a part of the local housing element working group. Um, we know it's, it's not easy to look ahead a full eight years to think through what the housing inventory will look like, uh, but this housing element does represent a commitment to create a policy context where, where housing is more likely to be built. Um, we want to say that we think the plan is ambitious in several areas, and we would just encourage you to see it as a guidepost. Um, please be flexible and, and adapt to what is working, uh, as you've done with ADUs. Um, and consider applying that to new types of housing, such as smaller and affordable by design housing that continue, as you've heard tonight, to be very difficult to develop in part because of the larger per unit size fees. Um, we think those creative policies can work for more than one type of housing. Um, just two general comments. Uh, although this, the, the housing element is a state mandated component of the general plan, we really do encourage you to view it as adding more and not less power to city governments to build housing. The state's many new policies are designed to help localities um, uh, pivot from past and restrictive laws that you on the council have inherited, but that no longer uh, truly match your climate needs or uh, commitment to equitable housing and, and the need to house workforce residents. Um, Secondly, part of that inheritance from the past includes a lot of dated ideas about the cost of new housing and especially the cost, the cost benefit terms of denser housing that simply mm -hmm. does not correspond um, with today's housing economy. Um, uh, and so for those of you who are participated in our housing 101 day, uh, you saw how outdated our sense of land use revenues can be and how those perceptions continue to favor traditional emphasis on low density housing. But today, the per acre tax revenue generated by denser units far outweighs those of single family homes. Um, and yet we continue to collect fees on denser units when in reality it's single family homes who uh, do not generate the revenue down the road. So please consider these kinds of flexible approaches as, as the housing uh, the cycle gets started. Um, the housing element is long term for a reason because it asks you to revise and adapt, but also because it allows you time to change broader ideas and perceptions about what housing is possible and why. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your service and we appreciate you moving this forward. Oh, 
Okay, we now um, will have Stephen followed by Chris. Stephen, you can unmute. Thank you, uh, Steve Bertelbo. I chair the Transportation and Land Use Coalition, and we are looking very carefully at the uh, requirements of the uh, Air Resources Board that we reduce driving at the rate of about 5% per year, 25% uh, reduction by 2030, and we appreciate the work that's being done on this. We hope that uh, as you uh, move forward, uh, you listen to the people that are asking for reduction or elimination of parking minimums, uh, and that uh, we really look at the fact that upcoming generations are less wedded to the car than uh, we think we, we like to think about them. Uh, the, uh, uh, there, there's a good deal of indication that people are waiting longer to get their driver's license. They're relying on uh, other forms of transportation, particularly e-bikes. E-bikes are making it able, uh, making us able to uh, commute uh, five miles on a bicycle and uh, be comfortable when we get to work. Uh, we need, to, we need to make our streets more comfortable, and we need to uh, separate the cost of parking a car from the cost of renting a house or, a, or an apartment. Uh, unbundling the cost of parking uh, will impress upon people the fact that you really don't need to have a car, and you can live more economically without one. So those are just some ideas about how we can proceed forward Thank you very much for what you're doing. Uh, hope to move this forward tonight. Thank you. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, uh, we will now have uh, Chris, if you can unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thanks so much. Just want to quickly echo uh, the thanks for staff and council for all the hard work on this, the consultants as well. Um, I've been paying increasingly close attention to the process and appreciate, you know, how hard it is to, to keep making progress on this um, with the dizzying array of requirements from the state and, of course, all the, the differing points of view um, from the community. So just really appreciate the effort. I also want to underscore, um, as others have, that, you know, this is a visionary document and, and should be a visionary document. And I especially want to um, join the chorus of folks that are connecting the dots between housing, transportation, land use. Obviously, in the city and in the county broadly, transportation itself is a very significant land use issue. And um, we do need much, much denser development, but in order for that to work and in order for it to create the city that we really want, we need much more people-friendly streets. So that's biking, but it's also pedestrian infrastructure. Um, I was struck by uh, the, the gentleman who, um, you know, emphasized that it's just not realistic to build without parking. And of course, there's lots of examples of, of where it is being done now. Um, so I think we should not give in to that, that inertia and that typical um, point of view that we can't change. We should be visionary uh, and we should bring the infrastructure into play to make that possible. Um, I'll end it there, but just want to say thank you. I know that's, that we'll get approved tonight and uh, also just really looking forward to working on the transportation elements to make sure this is a success. There are no more uh, callers and there are no pre-recorded messages. Thank you. With no additional members of the public that are wishing to speak, we will now close the public hearing. I'll bring it back to council for any final comments or questions. Council member Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I did want to just make a couple of comments as well, mostly because we've seen sort of this interesting juxtaposition in the press 
over a couple of different articles in the last few days. One was the article that I think ran today that talked about this discussion that we are going to have. And one was over the weekend, an article that talked about uh, more people leaving Sonoma County than coming in. And I've received a number of comments from folks who really were questioning, well, why do we continue to build housing if we have fewer people coming into the, the community than we have leaving? Uh, and first of all, I think it's really important for us to continue to fight that narrative and push back and say that just because we have been historically underhoused, oh, particularly for the last decade, doesn't mean that fewer people here is a good thing. Uh, when we look at the demographics, when we look at the fact that retired individuals in the community continue to grow and that the loss of individuals in the community are those who are the workforce or are younger, I think it tells us why this process is so important. There is not the ability for young people to get established in our community. When you think of the metrics, when you think of the life points, uh, going to school, meeting your significant other, buying your first homes, the things that root you in the community and allow you to live there do not happen in Santa Rosa at the same rate as other places because the cost of living is so high. And we heard from some businesses, Keysight is a great example of their inability to find workers who are here because people are leaving and the inability to attract workers who, uh, Councilmember Okrepke and I were just talking about issues that the city is having where we find qualified people who look at the salary and say, that's great, that's so much more than I'm making elsewhere. And then they look at the cost of living and they're like, there's no way I can go there. Uh, so I want to thank staff for this. I want to thank the community for showing up in support today. And I really want to thank staff for not trying to take a, an easy way out. We've been hearing stories of Hillsboro and other communities that have tried to game the system to actually build less housing or housing of a different type, a more appropriate type. Uh, I think our plan that's being put forward today is a plan that's realistic for our community that looks at the need in our community and tries to pri provide an appropriate response. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for their participation in it. Are there any council member L. Krepke? Yeah, I'd just like to um, first reiterate what uh, Councilmember Rogers said, and thank you to staff so much for all the work you've put into this. Thank you for all the stakeholders in the community, as well as all of you who have uh, given public comment. And also remember that um, we hear everything you guys are saying, and this isn't the only chance that we're going to have to address any of your concerns. Um, we do have our goal setting coming up. That is a great opportunity for you to show up and talk about housing and what you want to see in housing. Um, and to, to Council Member Rogers' point of us talking earlier about uh, recruitment, yeah, it's it's and being younger, um, living here and trying to, to buy a house, it's it's intimidating. It's intimidating to try to move to Santa Rosa as a young person um, to start a career and start a family, and we are very cognizant of that. Um, uh, as a whole council, and um, so don't just because of, uh, of if any changes aren't made tonight that you are happy with doesn't mean that it's going unheard and that it won't be addressed at a later date or discussed at a later date. I want to sh assure everybody of that. Are there any additional comments from council members or questions? All right, seeing none, Council Member Rogers, if you would please make a motion. All right, I'll put a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting an addendum to the 2035 General Plan Environmental Impact Report for a General Plan Amendment to update the housing element of the General Plan for the period of 2023 to 2031. And I also heard, and I'll wait for the reading of the text, but then I also heard staff ask for a little bit of leeway in case they need to make minor tweaks without having to come back through the full process. So I'll include that in my motion as well. Second. All right, we have a motion from Council Member Rogers and a second from Council Member Okrepke. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with six ayes with Councilmember Stapp absent. I will also make a 
motion approving the resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a general plan amendment to update the housing element of the general plan for the period of 2023 to 2031, including affirmatively furthering fair housing in compliance with the state housing element law and authorizing staff to submit the adopted housing element to the California Department of Housing and Community Development for certification and waive further reading of the text. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Rogers and a second from Council Member Okrepke. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with six ayes, with Council Member Stapp absent. Again, much thanks to our staff and also the stakeholders in the community. And if I can add, I think that we're all stakeholders in the community. So thank you very much for your participation um, in the hard work. We'll be now moving to item 15, report items. So 15.1, Madam City Manager. Item 15.1, a resolution making resolution making required findings and approving the hiring of Jeffrey Burke, retired annuitant, as a temporary employee to serve as part to serve part-time acting chief assistant city attorney for a period of a limited duration. I will turn this over to City Attorney Gallagher. Sorry, actually, um, HR Director Amy Reeve will be doing the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Amy Reeve, the Director of Human Resources. And before you for consideration this evening is an item approving the hiring of Jeffrey Burke as a temporary employee and retired annuitant to serve as part-time acting Chief Assistant City Attorney for a period of limited duration. Jeffrey Burke retired from his position as the Chief Assistant City Attorney on January 4th, 2023, and the City is currently conducting an open recruitment for his replacement. It is anticipated that the recruitment process could take between four and six months, and there are critical issues and projects pending which will need to be addressed while the recruitment for a permanent replacement is ongoing. Mr. Burke has the specialized knowledge and skills required to address those critical issues and projects. To ensure a smooth transition and uninterrupted city operations, it is recommended that Mr. Burke be returned as a temporary employee to serve in the position of part-time acting chief assistant city attorney until February 20th, 2024, or until a replacement is appointed. Mr. Burke is a CalPERS retired annuitant and his employment is therefore governed by CalPERS regulations. 
the CalPERS regulations allow a retired person to serve without uh, reinstatement upon an interim appointment by the council to a position that's currently vacant during a recruitment period and deemed by the council to require specialized skills or an emergency situation to prevent the stoppage of public business. Pursuant to the CalPERS Government Code Section 7522.56 F1, retirees shall not be eligible to begin work for a period of 180 days following the date of their retirement unless the council does certify the nature of the appointment meets those requirements stated above and that the appointment is necessary to fill a critical need within that initial period. The CalPERS, the CalPERS regulations require that the appointment be of limited duration, that it must have a beginning and an end date, that the retiree will not work more than 960 hours each fiscal year, and that the compensation must be within the existing hourly range for the chief assistant city attorney. Additionally, a retiree shall not receive any benefit, incentive, compensation in lieu of benefits, or any other form of compensation other than the hourly pay rate. Finally, it is recommended by the City Attorney's Office and the Human Resources Department that the Council, by resolution, approve Jeffrey Burke to be hired as a temporary employee to the position of part-time Acting Chief Assistant City Attorney for a limited period from February 21st, 2023 through February 20th, 2024, or until the permanent full-time position is filled, whichever is sooner and to certify the appointment is necessary to fill the critical position of Chief Assistant City Attorney. With that, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. Are there any questions from Council? Seeing none here, are there any online? Seeing none there. Um, who has this? Council Member Okrepke. I'll move a resolution of the City Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving hiring of Jeffrey Burke as a temporary part-time employee into the position of Acting Chief Assistant City Attorney for a limited duration from February 21st, 2023 through February 20th, 2024 or until the permanent position is filled and waive for the reading of the text. I'll second, but I th did we get the dates correct? And Mayor, we need to take public comment on this item also. Uh, the, the dates are correct from starting February 21st, um, and we've made it for a year duration in the event that we have difficulties for the appointment. So that is correct. And I'm sorry, did I miss that you open the for public comment? You missed it because I didn't do it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I think we have a, a motion by Okrepke and a second by Rogers, but if we can go ahead and open public comment. We are now taking public comment on item 15.1. If you're in the chambers, please go ahead and make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You'll have three minutes to comment and a timer will alert you at the conclusion of that period. I'm seeing no public comment in chambers. Do we have any Zoom comment? Uh, no, we had no raised hands and no pre-recorded comments. Thank you so much. So we have a motion by Council Member Okrepke and a second by Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. The motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Stapp absent. Moving to item 17, written communications, we have none. Item 18 is our last public comment on non-agenda matters. If you would like to make a comment and you are in the chamber, please make your way to the podium seeing None, seeing no hands raised on Zoom. Are there any other comments? 
All right. right. Seeing none, um, we will now go to our announcements. Um, and I just wanted to point out that we will be having some local art in the chamber uh, throughout February. So thank you very much to the students uh, in our city that have uh, provided us with their art um, for February. Um, and happy Black History Month to all. And I think that is all. Meeting adjourned. Thank you so much.